And once again, hello everyone. It's a real pleasure seeing you in such a large number. Uh, my name is Artur Slantans. I'm a support engineer at Zabbix, and coincidentally, I am your host for this here meetup. Um, we have quite a lot of people. I can see that there are still people joining. It's a really, really large number, and we're really excited to have you here. Um, this is going to be a great event, a great event dedicated to 5.0. I can see we have people from all over the world, Brazil, Munich, Poland, Bangalore. This, this is the beauty of online. And, and like I said before, we are really extremely excited, all of us, uh, to host this. So you can see some of the do's and don'ts, don'ts on the screen. I'm going to talk about them before our first speaker. So all of your mics are muted, not to cause any additional noise. Um, we have the Q&A section. Let's use that for questions. We can use chat for you know casual chatting, eyes, hellos, and so on. But let's Q use Q&A for questions regarding the presentations. So yes, you can ask your questions during the presentation in the Q&A section, and we will try to answer them either live or respond to you directly in the Q&A session. Like I said, use chat for networking, discussion, applause, banter, greetings, anything goes, just, just have fun in the chat. Well, almost anything goes, of course, within reason. And here you can see the hashtag, hashtag Zabbix Meetup Online. You can use this to maybe share screenshots, just share your impressions, um, tell us how well we did, praise us, and so on. So that's it for the details of this whole event. And for our first speaker, I will invite the Zabbix creator himself, the founder, CEO of the company, Alexey Vladishev. Let's welcome as our first speaker. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, yes, we are talking about 5.0 LTS. Uh, it's really great to see so many people interested in Zabbix. And uh, all right, I guess so we should start right now. Uh, my name is Alexey Vladishev. I'm a founder and CEO of Zabbix. I've been working with Zabbix for more than 20 years. And today, uh, the main topic is 5.0 LTS. But let me quickly recap what we managed to implement in 4.2 and 4.4. Those are the previous versions of Zabbix. And actually, if you have a look at 4.2, which was released in April last year, actually, uh, I, I'm telling about this just to see the difference between 4.0, the previous LTS release, and 5.0. But in between, we had 4.2 and 4.4. So 4.4 came with the high frequency monitoring with the support of throttling. And uh, actually, um, it, it really allows to scale Zabbix in a very, very good way. It basically means uh, that we are able to collect millions of metrics per second without putting too much stress on Zabbix infrastructure. Uh, also, we implemented the data collection using HTTP agent. And HTTP agent is basically the way how the modern uh, application communicates, modern services communicate. This way, we may extract information out of different APIs, say, for example, the cloud APIs, or, uh, or we, we may use HTTP protocol to, use, uh, uh, to, to, to monitor different applications and services. Uh, we also implemented a support of uh, data retrieval from Prometheus agents, which is really, really cool, because if you have, for example, the Kubernetes cluster with the Prometheus agents already running there, uh, it's really an easy way to integrate Zabbix and get data out of Prometheus. Zabbix 4.2 came also with um, huge uh, improvements uh, related to uh, pre-processing. Uh, we implemented the validation. We also, uh, we also implemented support of JavaScript. It basically means that whatever data we collect, basically, the JSON, XML, uh, uh, CSV, unstructured data, we can transform all the data using pre-processing rules. And if something is not there, we have, we have JavaScript. And JavaScript gives us a, a huge level of flexibility. We have also implemented pre-processing by proxies for, for, extra flex, for extra scalability. So this way, we may scale Zabbix deployment very well. And also, we implemented the tag management. So tags can be configured on a host level, on a template, template level, and it's really, really easy to, to manage them. Uh, then the 4.4, uh, version 4.4, uh, what was implemented? The new Zabbix agent. Great. I will talk about this a little bit uh, more today. 
uh, web hooks for alerting and notification. This is an excellent way how to basically integrate Zabbix with external systems, with ITSM systems or alerting systems and messaging system, again, using the whole logic written in a JavaScript and it, it, it becomes a part of Zabbix configuration, which is really, really cool because we don't have to deal with any external scripts. What else? Support of Timescale DB. We'll talk about Timescale DB uh, today as well in one of the talks later. Uh, also the built-in knowledge base. So basically we have a matrix, ma matrix descriptions, trigger descriptions, and this is a very good source of valuable information. So we can, by, by just one mouse click, we can uh, understand what is a metric is about, what is, what is, uh, what are, uh, we, we, we can know all the details of the specific metric or, or a trigger, which is really, really cool. And also in 4.4 in September last year, we introduced uh, the standard for Zabbix template. So if you're creating a new Zabbix template, uh, you have the best practices, how to make it in the best, best possible way. And now let's talk about Zabbix 5.0. It was released, it's, it's very fresh at HUT. Uh, it was released just uh, one week um, ago. And um, it's uh, again, it's LTS release. LTS stands for long-term support. It basically means that uh, we are going to support 5.0 for, for the next, uh, for the next uh, five years. Uh, so this is uh, really, really cool. And this release is really important for us. So uh, if you want to know what Zabbix is able to monitor, we have a special page on Zabbix, on Zabbix home uh, page uh, under integration. So you go to zabbix.com slash integrations and you can see that Zabbix is able to monitor different things. Well, it's, it's, it's monitoring of different applications, different network devices, uh, different services and cloud services. And from one hand and from the other hand, Zabbix, uh, can be well integrated with, uh, with uh, uh, as I said earlier, ITSM systems, ticketing system, incident management systems, uh, also um, alerting systems and so on. So from one hand, we are trying to make uh, templates as easy as possible. We're introducing plugins for Zabbix Agent 2 just to simplify data collection from one hand. From the other hand, we are giving a framework, those webhooks uh, written in JavaScript to simplify integration with the external, with the external systems. Okay, webhooks. Uh, Zabbix uh, 5.0, it comes with support of those ticketing systems just out of the box. You install Zabbix and Zabbix can, it goes with the integrations, ready to use integrations with OTRS, Jira, Jira Service Desk, Zendesk, uh, ServiceNow, Zemet, and some others. Also, Zabbix comes with support of many alerting and notification system out of the box. Slack, uh, Microsoft Teams, I know, OpsGenie, PagerDuty, VictorOps, Mattermost, and, 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 and many others. So this is, I think, the huge improvement. So we are not delivering just a, the product, the software, but we are also delivering a ready to use integration so that you can you can install Zabbix 5.0 and those integration are available out of the box. Really, really cool. Now, it's, uh, and this part is about monitoring. So uh, in addition to those uh, plugins and, uh, and webhooks, we, we also providing a number of uh, new templates, brand new templates, uh, sometimes along with the plugins for monitoring of uh, popular applications like MySQL, Postgres, HA Proxy, Memcache, and Jinx, uh, updated templates for uh, Windows, uh, Linux monitoring, Redis, Elasticsearch, and, and some others. Again, install Zabbix and you get those out of the box, officially supported by Zabbix team. What else? Uh, suppose you have, you suppose you, you created a template or a plugin or, or some webhook and you want, to, you want to share with the community or maybe a better way is to make it part of Zabbix. And now we have a very easy way how you can contribute. So, well, first you, we just uh, sort out the formal side by signing Zabbix contributor agreement. That's what you have to do. Then you just make a Zabbix, um, you make a, a pull request uh, to Zabbix code base and our team, our QA team, uh, integration team, they will review your pull request. And if everything is fine, 
then okay, your plugin will be accepted and it will be supported by Zabbix uh, team officially. So I guess it's a very uh, kind of win-win situation for you, Zabbix community and us. Um, Zabbix is uh, Zabbix is a free and open source uh, solution. So we don't have any proprietary or closed uh, source releases of Zabbix. Everything we, we do is released under GPL version 2 license. Actually, Linux uses exactly the same license. So it's a free and open source software. Uh, so the software is free, but we are also trying to make sure that it's available to users of many Linux distributions uh, and clouds. So we do provide official packages for modern distributions, Red Hat Enterprise, Linux CentOS, Debian, SUSE, Ubuntu, uh, we have also packages for SBN Pi. If you want to deploy um, some low-cost proxies running on top of Raspberry Pi hardware, so this is a perfect, perfect way how you can do this. And also the Linux appliance images for virtualization platforms. Also, Zabbix, uh, Zabbix is available in, in all public clouds. AWS, uh, Azure, uh, GCP, also we just introduced Zabbix in a, in a, in a digital ocean, also Red Hat OpenShift marketplace. So if you want to deploy Zabbix in the cloud, you, you go to the, your favorite public cloud and select uh, Zabbix official image and it's there. So really, really cool. Um, okay, now let's talk about some of the major features of Zabbix 5.0. Okay, uh, first, uh, it's official support of, of the new Zabbix agent for Linux and Windows. And let me remind you, what is new Zabbix agent? So new Zabbix agent, I really believe this is one of the most advanced monitoring agents of the market. So it supports all modern techniques, how data can be, can be collected basically. It has a plugin infrastructure. It's written in a Golang. Uh, it supports long running scripts. It supports a parallel execution of all types of checks. It supports persistent connections. So basically, if you want to monitor, for example, the database uh, and uh, the agent is able to keep a persistent connection also for the extra efficiency, yeah? So, uh, also, and, and the good thing is that it's a, it's a drop-in replacement of the existing agent. So in order to take advantage of those new features, what you need to do, you just replace the older binary with the new binary of the new Zabbix agent, and that's it. And you get all those new exciting features. What else? In Zabbix 5.0, we introduced uh, support of the persistent storage for the new agent. So what does it mean, basically? Suppose you have Zabbix agent monitoring some system. Uh, and this agent collects some data and sends to Zabbix server. But if there is no communication at this moment, Zabbix agent would keep uh, some, well, information, uh, some portion of the information in, in a local buffer in memory, okay? Uh, but starting from Zabbix 5.0, we have option. We can keep the, this information, collected data in the local file system. And obviously it gives a number of advantages to us. First of all, uh, obviously, if you have no, if you don't have a stable communication, this is really good, good solution. We don't lose any data, regardless of how much of the data we have. Also, it's really allows you, allows us to do some kind of mission critical monitoring when we don't want to lose any bits of data. Okay, so all data will be stored in local file system. As soon as communication is back, Zabbix agent will start pushing data, this older data, to, to Zabbix server side. And uh, another typical case when you have, say, a satellite connection which is on and off for some long periods of time, and this is also a perfect solution for this type of use cases. What else? Uh, secure by design. We made lots of security-related improvements in Zabbix 5.0. And uh, stay with us, there will be another talk uh, today and we'll talk in, a, in a much more details about the security related improvements, there are, there are many. What else? Usability improvements. Um, and usability, it's not only about how Zabbix front end looks like. It's not only about, uh, I don't know, some, some layout or maybe colors and so on. It's, it's kind of about the general usability of, of the product. It's about uh, 
is it easy to use a product or not? So in Zabbix 5.0, we changed layout of the Zabbix front end and we decided to optimize it for wide screens because in most cases, I think we all are running uh, some wide screens. Um, and uh, so basically we moved, we moved the top level menu to the left side. Okay, and, and this menu may run in the three different modes. It can be on and displayed all the time. It could be, it could be minimized or you, we, we can hide it. Yeah, so it really gives us a little bit more of usable disk space, uh, of usable screen space. What else? Uh, just a minor usability improvement. Now it's really easy to, to copy uh, dashboard widgets. If we deal with the dashboard uh, dashboard creation on a daily basis, it's really it's really it's really useful because now we we can select a widget, copy it, and then paste it to the same or to a different dashboard. So yeah, really really nice improvement. What else? Uh, now it's also possible to export graphs as a PNG image from from a from a Zabbix dashboard. So what we do? We just uh, okay. Say I'm interested in a, some graph. What I do, I click, I click on a widget, on a specific widget, and then I download this image as a PNG. Okay, this PNG file, so I can, I can just uh, uh, copy paste it and send by email, for example. We have also introduced the filtering by tags for some widgets, for problem related widget, problem by severity and problem host. And it basically means like in my case, as you see, uh, I have uh, two filtering options. Uh, I'm interested in the problems with the New York data center, uh, which are related to some service, okay? So I have a two filtering options service and data center in New York. And then I could see my widget like this. So this is this aggregated view. New York data center problems. Maybe I have a different filter for Frankfurt data center. And this is a less aggregated view, just uh, all problems related to any services whenever they are running. Um, Zabbix 5.0 also comes with support of UI modules. So now we have a perfect way how to extend Zabbix without making any changes in Zabbix itself. Okay, so you may create independent modules to extend functionality of Zabbix front end. And you can, what, 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 what it, it enables basically a few things. One, we may extend existing functionality. We may uh, create a new pages. We may create a new menu entries. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is also a perfect way how we can share those models uh, among other users. Yeah, because those models are, are very independent with just uh, a, a few, few files basically. And just a quick example of some sort of hello world uh, model. Um, so the model is basically a directory with a few files and the, some files are mandatory like in my case this is a manifest JSON and also model.php so manifest basically describes what this model is about the versioning of the model the author name uh, description and so on and so forth some very basic information and then we have a model.php and then we have some extra files like views uh, and actions, and of course, we should have some, at least some minimum uh, development experience in a PHP in order to develop uh, our own model. But anyway, we may we may uh, develop our models, or we may use uh, models which were developed by someone else. Uh, Zabbix 5.0 front end comes with uh, another view, which is monitoring host. So finally. Uh, we have a very nice view which describes and, and actually which lists all devices we, we monitor. Uh, like in my case, I have this monitoring host and I see, all right, I have a number of devices, obviously from AWS cloud. I have those uh, interfaces, so IP addresses, port numbers, I have availability information, tags of those devices. I have also information about the problems, how many problems I have per device and a quick navigation to host related information, like uh, quick navigation to problems with this specific device, graphs, screens, 
uh, web monitoring and so on. As you may notice, we don't have monitoring graphs and monitoring web anymore. So no menu entries for monitoring web, monitoring graphs. It's all been moved to under monitoring host. So really, really cool. I think this is a very nice improvement. And uh, monitoring host also comes with advanced filtering option, like in this case. And for example, if I want to see some, uh, well, if I want to see a list of devices having problems, I, I could select, okay, uh, what severities of problems I'm interested in? Uh, what devices having which tags or tag values I'm interested in? So this is really, really powerful tool, especially if we have a large scale monitoring with the thousands, maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of devices we monitor. Uh, just a few minor improvements uh, replace pre-processing operation. Uh, it is really cool uh, because now if you want to replace some string with another string, we have to use maybe a regular expression or some JavaScript code, but this is something very basic. So we decided to, to introduce replace string operator. And uh, like in, in my example, as you can see, it is used to have some sort of mapping between text value and numeric representation of the data. Like in my case, replace up with zero and replace down with one, okay? Because I receive up and down messages as text. I want to have zero and one to get maybe some statistics or to, to have some graphs, to have some more complex trigger expressions. Okay, so yeah, so something very simple can be used for mapping, can be used for replacing or removing characters in a, in a incoming, incoming data. Uh, new operator for JSON path, this sign, the special sign like tilde sign, and uh, it returns a property names of matching elements. Like in this quick example, we are getting uh, services from a console, uh, as you can see, it, it, it comes in a JSON, like a console, content, login, mail. And using this operator, we are, get, we are getting property names. And property names are basically our service names. And in the end, we receive console, content, login, and mail services. And then we may use this information for low-level discovery, for automatic creation of metrics and triggers for monitoring. So it's all about automation. So now... Uh, small improvement is, is about email notifications. So now when Zabbix generates some email messages, we see those messages like, like kind of in a plain format. One message, another message, another message, but not anymore. Starting from Zabbix 5.0, all messages can be grouped by, uh, or basically they will be grouped by, by a problem they, they are associated with. So all email messages uh, related to a specific problem will be basically grouped by our email client. So very, very cool. What else? Uh, mass update of user macros for host and templates. Uh, this is a very nice feature, especially for those who are dealing with the tag management. Okay. Oh, sorry, with the user macro management. Okay. So in this case, uh, we can add mass add uh, user macros, update them. We can also remove them from a selected host or a selected uh, templates or remove, remove all. Uh, nice improvement, but very, very useful. Um, another nice feature is about JavaScript. And JavaScript at this moment, it plays quite important role in Zabbix. So now we may use JavaScript for web hooks to create a new integrations with external systems, uh, with the ticketing systems, uh, we may also use a JavaScript for complex pre-processing and data transformations. And uh, we know that, and I, I think the JavaScript will be used for some other purposes as well. I know that mo many of us, maybe most of us prefer to work with uh, some uh, command line utilities. And we introduced a command line utility called Zabbix.js to deal with uh, JavaScript, with some JavaScript, to, to execute basically JavaScript code. So JavaScript, Zabbix.js, what it, what it does, it executes a JavaScript code, which uh, accepts some input and produce some output. And basically that's it. It's used for testing JavaScript code. Just we'll give you a few examples. A very, a very simple one just for demonstration sake. 
the first one test JS it just return the log logarithmic va value yeah of the value uh, and uh, so we execute Zabbix JS uh, test test dot JS this is a script name and then goes parameter input parameter 10 and the script returns me a, a, a logarithm of, of this value so very very simple another example is a little bit more complex suppose my script is dealing with some complex JSON preprocessing and I have incoming data in my my dot JSON file so this way I could tell okay please execute this JavaScript using this input file very easy and in order to make troubleshooting of JavaScript a little bit more easier we have also introduced a new function which is called zabbix.log which is really helpful if you want to output some de de debug messages or maybe a value of, uh, of a variable which we use in the JavaScript. So very, very nice things. It's all done in order to simplify creation of, a, of, a, of uh, integrations and pre-processing rules based on JavaScript. What else? Uh, triggers now support a text operations. So operations with the text data. So this is really, really cool. And uh, there are a number of typical use cases. Uh, sometimes, obviously, we receive data as a text. Okay, maybe up, down, maybe version numbers, some checksums, SH8256 or MD5, whatever. Maybe some file names or something like that. And obviously, we want to have ability to work with this data. Okay, and, and now we have it. Now we have it. Uh, just we'll give you a few examples what we may do right now so we may uh, compare metric value with some constants the text constant like suppose i monitor the version of zabbix it's uh, and i want to i want to verify that it's running 500 all right okay it's equal to 500 or i can also use a user macro instead of the constant for extra flexibility i can i can do it no problem uh it's also possible to compare last value with the previous one or last value with the pre previous one it's it's really up to you it's also possible to compare text data coming from a different items so really really cool and uh, finally we go to rid of uh, this quite unfortunate limitation of azabix trigger expressions automation and discovery Automation is really important, especially uh, as we scale. Yeah, so we monitor five devices. That's fine. Maybe I don't know hundreds of devices. So we are still fine. But if you're talking about large-scale monitoring, well, it's just impossible without some level of automation and discovery. So automation is is really our friend. Uh, and uh, in Zabbix 5.0, we have introduced support of a uh, few additional metrics. One is for Java monitoring. It's about discovery of GMX counters. Um, okay, so two new GMX checks, GMX get and GMX discovery. So if you, if you do monitoring of Java applications, you want Zabbix to discover metrics automatically. If you want to have some smarter templates, please use these new checks. We have also introduced discovery of Windows performance counters uh so this way we can do also very interesting things like discovery for example number of processes we have file systems uh, all information basically which is stored in windows performance counters can be used for discovery right now what else discovery of ipmi sensors additional key ipmi get all right so this way this way we, we get the list of available ipmi counters so this is really really cool what else uh support uh, and actually all those improvements related to new item keys it's all about to make more automation in zabbix is to take advantage of a low level discovery which creates your items your triggers and graphs automatically without any without any human intervention so this is really really cool so just use use low level discovery use items for for discovery what else support of user macros for host prototypes uh 
host prototypes is the way how we create new devices, new host automatically, all right? So Zabbix uh, takes, for example, the some JSON data, and uh, in this JSON data, we have array of uh, hosts, which we'd like to add to Zabbix for monitoring. And those hosts will be based on a host prototype. Host pro prototype, I will remind you, is just, it's kind of a host template, okay? And uh, host prototype looks very much like a normal host. And uh, it didn't support it user macros in 4.0 and 4.4, but not anymore. Now user macros are supported. So you may define as many macros you want. And what you can also do, you may use a values of low level discovery macros in as, as a values of user macros. So this is really, really powerful combination. If you are dealing with low level discovery, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure this feature is, is you will you will appreciate this feature very much. Uh, support of float 64 data type. Uh, so float 64 is basically kind of de facto standard. And uh, the, the, the obvious benefit is that it's compatible with float 64 implementation returned by Prometheus, which is really, really cool. And um, obviously you may ask how to upgrade from existing system, uh, existing installation, because it will require a little bit of transformation of existing historical data you already have in your database um, and uh, wait for wait for another talk today and we'll talk specifically the last talk today will be specifically about upgrade upgrading Zabbix to a newer to, to, to Zabbix 5.0 LTS so it will be described there but it's 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 really easy uh, we have implemented a number of scalability improvements the one is about Zabbix front end. So um, what we did, we, we made sure, we basically we reviewed Zabbix front end to make sure that it is scalable to, 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 to display and to deal with the millions of devices. Not, not, not metrics, it's about tens of millions of metrics and triggers, but it's about the number of devices. And uh, we made a number of improvements. We got rid of drop downs, which are not scalable at all if you have a large number of hosts or maybe host groups. We also, uh, we also limited, uh, made some hardcore limits on the number of uh, basically rows and the columns that can be displayed in all overview screens. We have also redesigned monitoring host graphs a little bit. And we have also introduced paging whenever possible. Yeah, so Zabbix is ready to, Zabbix UI is ready to monitor millions of devices right now. Another improvement is about data compression for time series data. Okay, this is just a little bit of spoiler. I will not, I'm not going to spoil the next or uh, next after the next talk, but it's about, it's about much more efficient uh, data data storage so stay with us and uh, you'll you, you'll hear more 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 details from from another talk today um, now it's also possible to manage low level discovery rules globally it basically means that we have introduced a quite advanced filtering option for discovery rules and now it's also possible do things like say i want to see all the list of all discovery rules which are not supported yeah for for all well system wide basically all right that's what 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 i can do i just select state not supported i just uh, remove the host groups filtering host filtering and i will get a list of discovery rules which are not supported by zabbix so it's really really useful for troubleshooting to make sure that your system is configured properly and everything is working fine. What else? Ability to an acknowledge event. You obviously know that in Zabbix you may acknowledge event, but now you may also an unacknowledge event. And uh, as you can see in, uh, well, we have basically introduced a new pop-up for an acknowledgement, which is a little bit easier to use because we are staying on the same page. And uh, if, a, if, if a problem has been already acknowledged, it's really easy to unacknowledge it. Just one click, 
and we and acknowledge it. There are two use cases, I think. One is uh, that we can fix some mistakes. If we acknowledge the problem by mistake, all right, now we can fix fix it. Okay, just revert uh, acknowledgement state. And I think that this acknowledgement uh, state and the acknowledgement flag for a problem it may help to create a, a better a better and more sophisticated uh, workflow to work with the to deal with the problems uh, Zavix 5.0 also comes with another quite powerful feature for low level discovery as you can see we are talking quite a lot about low level discovery but low level discovery is really really powerful tool for automation how to how to for 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 discovery yeah so that's why there are many improvements related to to low level discovery and i'm sure that there will be even more in the new versions of zabbix so overrides for level of discovery rules what's all about so suppose i have a system or maybe many different systems and i discover uh, a file system there Okay, I want to discover all file systems. I want to monitor them immediately, say monitor some basic things like a Frigix space and free inodes. Uh, and, uh, but on some systems, I have also, I, I have also storage of or storages of Oracle uh, for, which are used for Oracle databases, yeah, like Aura data. And uh, I want some special processing. I want to create some special triggers, maybe triggers with a special severity for Oracle related file system. So what should I do? I just create an override rule, like it's called special processing of Oracle uh, directories in my case. I create a, a filter kind of condition if my file system name matches Aura data. And if it matches, then I could execute some operations, basically kind of override, overrides, um, override operations. Uh, and in my case, this is a very simple, I just uh, increase the severity. I set severity too high. So for, no, for ordinary file systems, severity will be warning. It will be taken from a item prototype but for oracle file system it would be set to high so really really cool and another thing when it might be useful for example i don't want to discover some file system like a temporary file system so in my case uh, if file system name matches tmp i create a new operation which is related to to item prototypes and uh, in this operation i tell zabbix please don't create those items I don't want to have any items related to temporary file systems of Zabbix. Will not will not create those items. Therefore, no triggers will be created. Or no graphs will be created for those items. And as you can see, you have a number of options. For example, for uh, item prototypes, you may control or you can make exceptions. Uh, is it is it? Do you need to discover or not? You can control it discoverable or not discoverable you may have a different or override uh, update interval okay for example i want to monitor oracle specific uh, uh, file systems much more often or i may also control history storage period or trend storage period so this is really really cool so it's a really powerful feature again if you if you are dealing with low level discovery i'm absolutely sure you will you will uh, appreciate it as well um, uh, and a few few minor things. We have also implemented support of a few macros, very useful, like host ID in notifications can be used for backlinks. When you create a backlink to Zabbix UI, you can use a host ID. You, uh, we have also introduced event uh, tags JSON. It gives you all tags in a JSON format. It's really, really useful for webhooks. So using one parameter, you may pass all tag information to, to a webhook. And also, which another, another macro which I personally like very much, it's event duration. And it's especially useful in recovery message, like in my case, recovery message is resolved in event duration uh, macro, 
So event duration in my case was uh, replaced with the five minutes, okay? Resolved in five minutes. So as soon as I get recovery message, I say clearly, okay, what was the duration of the problem? Five minutes or maybe a few seconds or maybe a few hours. So you can see how critical it was. Really nice. And there are a number of other improvements. We'll talk about some of them later today. Uh, I will mention a few, like increase size of acknowledge message to four kilobytes. We also increase the, we increase the size of uh, item. Uh, I think to two kilobytes, let me check. Yeah, to two kilobytes, it was 255. Uh, support of Elasticsearch 7.0, uh, 7.4 and 7.6. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, we'll talk about some things later today. Uh, also, a very interesting feature, especially for those who, does, uh, who use Zabbix for networking, for monitoring uh, of network, for network monitoring, sorry. Uh, now it's Zabbix has ability to flash SNMP cache. This is especially useful if you do SNMP version three monitoring. So we can flash SNMP cache in the runtime. So really, really powerful, really powerful feature. Uh, we have also removed some legacy. Okay, no Internet Explorer, DB2 is no longer supported. And so there are some other things uh, which you should be uh, careful about, but uh, please uh, read uh, release notes. And don't forget that today we are having another talk which is aimed specifically for upgrades. Yeah, upgrade. Alexander will cover it in the talk today. Basically, it's, it's, it's very easy and straightforward as, as always with Zabbix, I hope. Yeah, so please um, watch our next, next talks. Well, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, let's see if we have any questions. I'm ready to answer some. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. That was a great presentation. The excitement in chat was really clearly visible as we were going through the features. We could see like a lot of wows. I've been waiting for this for <laughs> ages and finally it's here and so on. So I think this is quite uh, an upgrade for people. So let's go through the questions. Question one, are there any plans for integration with Topdesk? Can you comment on that? Sorry, integration with what system? Topdesk. T-O-P desk. Oh, oh. Oh, P desk? Top. Top as in. Up desk. Up desk. Up desk yeah. uh, sorry. Mm, okay, I'll, I will double check. I will, I will check what, what, what is the system is about. Uh, sorry, I don't have any information right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then question number two. Now with tags mostly implemented as a whole, are there plans to remove host groups? Well, not yet, yeah, because we, we're using host groups for uh, user permissions. That's why, yeah, it would be a little bit risky decision right now. But maybe in the future, at some point, yeah, we, we may consider doing this, yeah. Yeah, but I guess this will be a major thing, like 6.0 or 7.0. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. This is a major thing, and we should, we should, we should be very careful about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, regarding automation, any plan on an official Terraform provider? Possibly, yeah. Possibly, okay. Um, so it could be in the pipeline, could be soonish in the pipeline, we'll, we'll see. Mm -hmm. um, question number four, any plans for JSON formatting in general for alerts? Um, I... I don't know actually why this question is asked because you may uh, have your messages in any different formats, including JSON. Maybe I misunderstood your question, sorry. Mm -hmm. So if you have any further comments, then maybe we can yeah. directly or, or yeah, while I'm asking questions, we can maybe. Yeah. Um, what about baseline monitoring? Can we expect it sometime? Yeah, actually the, the reason why Zabbix 5.0 was delayed a little bit, it was originally planned for the March this year, is just because we, 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 we tried to fit baseline monitoring in 5.5.0. Uh, but uh, then we decided, okay, let's, let's release 5.0 and introduce baseline monitoring in 5.2. So the short answer is that it's been postponed to 5.2. And 5.2 is, is October this year. All right, so let's wait till October and it should be there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's, that's all for the questions. Um, thank you a lot, Lexi. Like I said, everyone seems really excited and I think you should feel really proud about version 5.0 because yeah, the noise in the chat, it's like, it's crazy. 
<laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. All right. Um, so let's move on. And before we move on with our next speaker, uh, I see a lot of questions about will the presentations will be available, will the recording will be available. So the presentations will be sent out to each and every one of you. So they'll be available to you, all of the slides that Alexei went through that other colleagues will go through, they'll be available for you. Um, and regarding the recording, um, we're still not sure. We'll fit, we're, we are figuring out the technicalities of it and we're trying to see if we can provide recording of an acceptable quality to you. If we can, then maybe. If we cannot, then unfortunately, um, no. So we're kind of still working on it. First time for us, hey, first time for a lot of uh, companies. So still figuring it out. Time for our next speaker. So you've probably seen this guy on YouTube here and there, um, a good colleague of mine, also a support engineer, consultant, trainer, actually a senior support engineer, and I guess a YouTube personality of sorts when it comes to Zabbix. Um, it's Dmitry Slambert. Um, and he will talk about five seemingly small things that can maybe have a large impact in your environment. So let's welcome our next presenter, Dmitris Lamberts. Welcome, five small things for a big reason. So, hello guys, hello everybody. And uh, finally this moment has come and we are absolutely global. And finally I can say at the same time, good morning, good evening, hello to all of you. Uh, it's of course a big pleasure to not see you, but uh, know that you're all here and listening for the fresh news about Azabex. So my topic for today is indeed a five small things, uh, but for a big reason. And in a five small things, I'm going to talk about five features, five new features of the Zabbix 5.0. It's not a big secret that every uh, major release comes with a lot, really a lot of new features. Some of them are like uh, say super heavy extensive in terms of um, those are very technical features as example when the first time uh, the pre-processing was introduced or even long long ago in a history low-level discovery was added um, timescale db support those are really big things but also in every uh, major release there are some features in the new feature list that might seem like it's so small that we won't even feel it. So this presentation will be to explain five small things that really will make a big difference in your regular life with the Zabbix and will solve some ongoing issues that we had previously. So let's get started with the first one. And the first one is the nanosecond support in the Zabbix sender input file. So it's pretty straightforward, right? The, nothing new, Zabbix sender was here for a long time. Uh, you could use it, you could use it with an input file. So what comes new is ability to add a nanoseconds uh, in the input file if you are sending the values from the input. So um, what it is and, what, and how we used it before Zabbix 5.0. So what is Zabbix sender? It's pretty small utility, like uh, there's no, uh, let's say complexity to install it. There are no configuration files. Uh, just get it and use it. And there is only uh, one particular reason what it is for. So what you can do, you can execute it from the shell CMD line and simply send um, option one, uh, one single value to the Zabbix server or the proxy. So like in the example you see, we use the Zabbix sender minus Z where we specify the uh, host name or IP address of the server or the proxy, then minus S is the host name inside our front end, minus K for a key, and O is the value. And the second option is to use an input file. When and why we could use an input file? Well, for, for those cases when we do want to monitor some specific uh, services or applications, but uh, let's say the data is collected with some external script that we might have, um, and it is taking like more than 30 seconds to collect the data. And all of you should know at this moment that the maximal timeout option in the Zabbix is 30 seconds. And uh, even that is like not recommended to set to the maximal value right uh, at the start of your installation. So then we can use, uh, let's say, script with some cron scheduling that will run time to time on your system, write collected data to the text file, 
with the syntax hostname key timestamp and the value and then we just uh, time to time again utilize the Zabbix sender by specifying a path with a minus i to the input file which just sends the values to our Zabbix server with a proxy. So what was the problem? And um, the problem itself will be like much more complicated than than my topic today but uh, this was really big pain for those uh, installations that also use some sort of the replication or high availability setups. So when you have a high availability, most likely you will also have a database replication. And as example, Galera or the new inodb cluster for MySQL 8 does requires a primary key in a database of the Zabbix. The thing is that not all of the tables have the primary keys out of the box, including the history. So history does not have a primary key. Can we solve it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, option, there is only one. Uh, we had to manually add uh, primary keys to our database. So default history table structure looked like this. We have only four columns, item ID clock, value, and nanoseconds. And there were two options how we could add the primary keys. The first one on the item ID clock and nanosecond, which is a good option. Second one only on the item ID clock. It still works, but it's not that good. And in the next slide, you will see why. So we know the background. We know how the Zabbix Sender works. Uh, we know that there will be something with the primary keys. So what is that something? This is before 5.0, there was no option to specify nanoseconds in the input text file. So only thing that we could specify was the clock. Clock is the Unix time. So the minimal value for the clock will be one second. But Zabbix is evolving with every version, and uh, it's not a new thing for all of us that we are also talking about high frequency monitoring. And with high frequency monitoring, we mean more than collect one single value every second. So we could collect five values in one second, or even 50 values. And the problem was very simple. Uh, like if we had a Galera or any other replication which required us to add the primary keys and we used external scripts, which we most likely did to collect that um, high frequency metrics. And we try to write them in uh, the input file with the same Unix timestamp. There was no option to add uh, nanoseconds. What we got in the log file query failed because there is a duplicate entry based on the primary keys that we added. Right now we have a new option nanosecond, a new column, just one column, no new config files, no new utilities to install or configure, just upgrade your Zabbix sender, add additional column in the input file. So it will be this one where you specify the nanoseconds. You can still have the primary keys on the database tables. And as you can see, we use the Zabbix sender with an input file. Everything goes inside the database. There are no failed queries in uh, and the server log, and we of course can see all the latest data in the graphs and all the triggers are also processed. So that would be for the first one. Second, no data triggers and proxy availability. Very old, um, I don't know, feature uh, bug request, feature request most, like, most likely. So since now, since Zabbix 5.0, triggers do respect proxy availability. But if you want to be still informed about a host that are not, um, not reachable because there is a problem with the proxy, you can still configure your triggers to notify you about it. So um, a bit more deeper, Zabbix Next, which is a feature request which was created back in 2003, so 17 years ago, to implicit trigger dependency when monitored via proxy. We're talking about no data trigger functions and uh, what no data does, very simple. It checks whether there was data received from the host or not, that's it. If no data received for um, time period more than we define in the trigger parameters, then it will be a problem. So thing is that if the host is monitored by the proxy and host is working, host is functioning pretty fine, host is reporting data to the proxy, but for some reason there is some, let's say, network issue um, between the proxy and the server, which means the proxy is not able to transmit this data to the server, which means there is no data from the host, which means the server will treat this host as unreachable and will create a new problem um, 
which of course will be evaluated uh, by all of the actions, you will receive a notifications, which can lead for the event and alert storms because well, the problem is not with one single host, the problem is with a proxy. And behind that proxy, we might have hundreds or even thousands of the hosts, so which will end up in quite a lot of uh, emails, uh, maybe some um, remote commands or executed scripts for this problem, which we of course don't want to have. Um, for this, like the new feature itself, uh, there's again no technical difficulty for this. Uh, you don't need to uh, reconfigure anything. You don't need to add a new trigger functions. Everything will work as it is. And uh, I think the best way how to visualize this was in these um, pretty straightforward, right? We have one Zabbix agent which is monitored by the Zabbix proxy, which is successfully reporting data to the Zabbix server. So all the arrows are green, all the communication is working fine, end user is happy, network team is happy, everybody is, everything is good. Um, second scenario is that we're still monitoring one single Zabbix agent, which is absolutely fine reporting to the Zabbix proxy, but unfortunately there is some uh, network communication issue between the proxy and the server. So what we see in our front end and what the users will receive in the email, that um, no data problem. So agent, uh, the name of the agent is unreachable for more than uh, 15, 15 seconds or, or, or something. Um, another option, if we could have 5,000 agents monitored by the proxy, which are again, absolutely without any issues functioning, they are working, all the applications and services that we are monitoring on it are working absolutely fine, but the proxy is not able to deliver this data to our Zabbix server. So we end up with uh, 5,000 alerts problems in the front end, 5,000 notifications in the emails. So our alerter process will be most likely quite of utilized and busy, including the escalators. So by this problem, so when one of our proxies, our major proxies goes down, we might even like experience some other problems with uh, our installation. So when the Zabbix 5.0, when we finally have uh, the respect of the proxy um, availability from our no data triggers, even if we have 5,000 agents, uh, which are reporting to the proxy, which again has uh, communication issues to report back to the server, we will get only one problem, only one problem in the front end, only one problem in uh, notifications, and the message will be that the proxy is down, right? So the final notes, was there a way to solve this before 5.0? And uh, it's kind of yes and no, because, sorry, uh, because, um, what we could do, we could configure trigger dependencies, right? Uh, we could create a triggers, um, like unreachable trigger for the Zabbix agent already has a no data function by default. And uh, what we could do is create a dependency to the proxy availability. So let's say when the proxy is down and we monitor that, then those triggers don't fire. The problem is that all of that would take like a lot of time. It would be quite of complex to manage all that and follow through um, upon the changes. What if I don't want to respect the proxy availability? I still want to receive those 5,000 alerts uh, because it is important because, well, it still remains the fact that um, agents, hosts are running, but I am not receiving a data, right? So my monitoring is basically stopped. Even if there will be some kind of the problem on the host, I will not know that. So if you do want to receive these notifications, you need to use no data like five, which was, um, five minutes as a parameter, so more than five minutes, no data received, then it is a problem. So if you want to still receive the message, you need to add a new parameter, comma, strict. And the last one option that we might do was uh, global correlation, which also kind of allowed us um, to respect this uh, proxy availability. So right now, since the Zabbix 5.0, it's 100 times easier. There is really no complexity. You don't need to change any configuration or whatever else. Everything comes out of the box. So beautiful. Uh, feature number three test item from the user inter interface. So in the previous version, it was quite a difficult to um, understand whether our item is configured correctly, right? We are adding um, 
new items in the host and the templates, um, especially since we added quite a lot of reprocessing options. If we're adding those, uh, we don't know will it work as expected. And now it is possible um, to do that like in a clean way. So the options that we did before was simply wait for the next update uh, interval cycle, right? We create an item, we save everything, we add it to the host, and then we wait. Um, another option was Zabbix agent D minus T, but uh, this, uh, again, forces us to log in on the system where the Zabbix agent is running, and this is absolutely not simulating the native communication between the Zabbix server or proxy with an agent, so we are basically just executing the agent and forcing it to give us the value of some specified key. And the third most common option was to use a Zabbix get. So Zabbix get is a utility which allows you to connect to remote uh, passive agent, which again limits us uh, that communication, passive communication must be there. And um, yeah, it's just specify minus s as a host name and key as a key for which we want to receive the data. And uh, then we receive the data. But the problem, update intervals in our front end might be too big. Like if we have five hours update intervals, most likely we won't want to wait five hours to see our result. And then especially if we made some kind of mistake, update item, fix the problem, and again, wait five minutes just to confirm. In case of a custom intervals, it might be even worse because maybe we are checking this item only once per month, let's say first Monday of each month. Zabbix agent D and Zabbix get don't respect pre-processing. If we would be talking about this like, um, two, three years ago, probably this would not be a problem at all. Right now, also in the previous speech by Alexi, you already saw that there are tons of new pre-processing options which you can use uh, as a single pre-processing steps or all of them together to achieve your result. So when you're doing any kind of pre-processing, may it be just a simple uh, regular expression matching or may those be five pre-processing steps, including the JavaScript, uh, Zabbix get or Zabbix agent D will not give you the processed value. It will just show you the raw value which is gathered from the agent. Right now in 5.0, so in the front end, there's no need to use any like, um, shell utilities or something else in the front end when you're creating an item you just fill in all the parameters you fill in all the pre-processing um, fields steps and then in the bottom you will find a semi new button called test and when you click on it there are just a couple of fields that you need to fill first of all let's say even if the item is created on a host which will be my local host i can still execute it and test it over um, some other host. And we might skip talks about a host at all. Maybe I am creating just a template. I am creating the template on my development instance, which later after confirming that everything is working fine will be just exported and imported to my production instance. So right now from the dev um, environment, I can start creating a templates, templated items and test those uh, templated items um, against my let's say production or maybe also development environment hosts and get the value. If you wanna change the ports, so maybe your agents are running on some custom ports, that's not an issue at all. And if let's say uh, this monitoring for those hosts is uh, happening across the proxies, again, no problem at all. Just choose the proxy behind which that host is and the proxy will do all the stuff and you will get the value. So how it looks like in the result, let's say we have uh, Mm, this was a very simple example. It's just a system.host name. So system.host name against my local host uh, agent without any proxies involved and um, just click get value. And this is the raw data that we get from uh, our agent. And this is the same data that we get from the Zabbix get utility. But when we're using the Zabbix get, we don't see all this stuff. So there are five pre-processing steps on this uh, item configured and by using a new test option, I can see the result of every pre-processing steps, including the last result, which comes after all pre-processing. So this once again is uh, kind of small, but uh, super great and helpful feature that will simplify a lot uh, creation of the new items and uh, the new templates. Next one. Default, me, default message for each media type. 
Um, again, very simple, right? Um, media types, so we're talking about the actions, so we're talking about a part of configuration that will notify you about some problems in your monitored environment. What kind of options we had previously? Straightforward, open configuration actions, click on the action and change the message that you want to send to the user, right? Uh, you could change the subject, uh, the message. You can, of course, use internal macros to provide more meaningful information. It's kind of flexible, but what's the problem? Like, when we're working with Azabix, we always try to think about uh, that there are a lot of different installations, starting with a, quite a small setups that might include like 50, 100, uh, 200 hosts. And we also have users that are using 100,000 hosts, 500,000 hosts. Some users that are providing um, Zabbix as a monitoring service to their customers and uh, they're monitoring those customers within one single installation. And of course, every of those customers have different uh, policies and guidelines. So if we have, Im just imagine having like 100 actions and then somebody writes you an email in the morning that you need to uh, find an action for a customer B, which is sending a notification about uh, Windows servers that are running uh, Microsoft SQL, and you need to change the subject from A to B. How easy will it be? So it will be, of course, quite a complicated. Right now, it's a lot more flexible. It's a lot more easy in administration media types. So in the place where we define the sources, how we will send this message, maybe an email, or maybe we will create um, a new ticket in, um, I don't know, ServiceNow or, or Jira, or we might be setting a message to the Slack or the Discord by using um, not that long ago introduced webhooks, which are available out of the box. So for each step, for each media type, you see there is a new tab, message templates, in which you have an option to specify and choose a default message, a default subject for every possible operation of the event. So it might be just a freshly problem, or it might be a problem recovery, update on the problem. So let's say somebody acknowledged or changed the severity of it. Um, also discovery for the network discoveries and auto registration for uh, Zabbix uh, agent active registration, right? So it much it is much more convenient. Um, if we need to change something, we just go to administration media types, uh, make this one change on the media type, and if it is assigned to let's say 500 actions, this change will of course also apply on those existing actions. We also understand that there might be the cases that yes, there is. Uh, company guideline, how we want to inform on, let's say, uh, media type um, Slack for production. But at the same time, you can go back to the configuration actions where you used to, and let's say from the list of 100 actions that are using this media type, you can choose, let's say, just one and override these settings by specifying some other uh, message or some other subjects. So this, again, gives uh, great uh, flexibility, especially for those uh, very large environments that have hundreds of thousands of hosts and which also, of course, includes uh, having many, many um, actions in this case. And the last one, SNMP credentials at a host interface level. Again, simple thing. The problem with the typos, for all of you who are working, uh, or we're working with uh, SNMP monitoring, as long as we talk about uh, SNMP v1 or 2, no problem. When we talk about SNMP v3, probably already know there are quite a lot of parameters, uh, lowercase, uppercase, symbols, uh, digits, uh, letters, uh, make one problem and it doesn't work, right? The item is not supported, the host is not supported, uh, SNMP availability in the configuration host is red uh, with an authentication problem, right? Um, another new thing, so before we had SNMP v1, SNMP v2, SNMP v3, so we had to choose right now, all of that is just a SNMP agent. So how can we manage it? The same stuff that I told in a previous slide, like before, when we are creating item, let's say SNMP v3, we had 
tons of these parameters, long, different, hard to follow. Uh, we could also use a user matrices, of course. We could, right now, since 5.0, we can use a user matrices and hide those values uh, from unwanted eyes, so it will be secure. Nobody will see our passwords. But if we make one typo in one single item or one single prototype in the template that will um, also apply on 100,000 hosts in our environment, we might have uh, and end up with 100,000 unsupported items simply because I made, uh, uh, let's say, typo in a passphrase by specifying lowercase a instead of uppercase a. And when there are a lot of unsupported items, those can also affect the SNMP interface at all. So let's say we have uh, 200 items on a single host and 100 items are not working just because I made this one single typo in the template, right? So this will affect heavily. So instead of suggesti suggesting to guys, simply be careful, right? Uh, double check what you're writing, uh, write a correct passphrase, uh, password, authentication and, and other stuff, we try to help you. Uh, first of all, again, configuration will be simpler. There is no more SNMP v1, v2, v3 item types. There is just one item type, which is SNMP agent. All configuration is done on the interface level. So when you're creating a new host or editing an existing host, um, you know, those four interfaces, ABEX agent, SNMP, JMX, IPMI, this is how it looks like. So when we add a SNMP interface, just like it was before, IP address or DNS name, choose which you want to use, the port. Uh, then two new fields, choose a SNMP version, may it be v2, v3, or v1. So since 5.0, this will be the place where you choose the SNMP version. And then on the host level, on the interface level, you fill up all the authentication parameters. And all of the existing and new items that you will be creating will parent these, this configuration from the host level. So you won't have to uh, write down those authentication parameters for every new item that you will be creating, but only once on a host in the interface level. And still for those cases like uh, when your host might be having um, multiple interfaces, not that uncommon at all. You can of course add multiple interfaces on the host. One of them might be a SNMP v3, uh, another might be a SNMP v2, provide different parameters, use a different ports, and then when you're creating an item, simply choose which interface of a SNMP you will be using, and that's it. Again, you don't need to do any additional configuration. Or like another option which you can do is uh, simply like uh, bring those, uh, other interfaces to uh, the level of the new host. So if you have uh, some host that has two SNMP interfaces, instead of adding them in one single host, you can just create two hosts, right? And this will function also absolutely fine. So I guess that's it. With, with all the technical trouble, um, we got it till the end. <laughs> we got till thank you slide. Um, what about the questions? Yeah, thank you a lot. Um, we had some really, uh, some real excitement in the chat regarding, for example, test items feature. That's like a real lifesaver, and also the proxy trigger dependencies. Finally, people can get, can get that uh, whole thing functioning without you know any extra alerts or any extra crutches to fix it. Um, so we have two questions for you. As of now, maybe some more will come in. But the first question is. Not related to the topic at hand at all, <laughs> but it's related to your YouTube series. Do you plan on continuing it? If so, do you have anything in the works? Um, I don't know at the moment. Like, I should, I definitely should, but the thing is that um, right now, like, uh, things will change a little bit and I will be out of work for a month or so, uh, probably maybe after that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess that's the best answer I can give you for now. So there's still a chance. You're not dismissing it completely. I'm not saying like a uh, big no. Okay. So that's, that's something the hope is there. Um, second question is related to the topic at hand though. So question number two, is there any way to preserve backward compatibility with the new Zabbix sender nanosecond feature? I see now the value has shifted by one slot in the parameters. So it will break existing scripts. Um, like if we would have a Zabbix server 5.0 and the Zabbix senders, 
No, uh, because when you're executing a Zabbix sender, if you want to provide a nanoseconds, you, had to, you have to also additionally specify a new flag, uh, minus, minus uh, NS or something where capital N to actually enable sending those nanoseconds. So I think it should be fine even with uh, older senders. You just don't use a new parameter to actually send nanoseconds. And it will still use only for columns, which is just a simple clock. Yep. Thank you. That's, that's it. Thank you a lot. I think this was very useful, very, very nice and powerful features. All right. Always good to hear from you. Thank you. So next up, we're going to have a short five minute coffee break sponsored by your own fridge this time, not by us. So thank your fridges or uh, your coffee machines or your water bottles or whatever. Um, they'll help you uh, making it through this hydrated. Um, so five minute break, we'll be back in five minutes. And next up, I'll be showing you a presentation of mine regarding some security related features. So let's meet, be back in five minutes and then let's move on. So break time. All right, everyone. So the break is over, at least on our part. Hopefully everyone has managed to come back to us um, and is ready for the next presentation. Like I said, uh, next presentation will be hosted by me. So let me share my presentation and we can begin. All right, there we go. So Zabbix 5.0 security features and improvements. As Alexi already said, he did not cover it in much detail because I will be covering it right now. There are quite a lot of features. Also, I'm on camera. Hey, everyone. Um, there are a lot of features, um, 11 or 12 topics. Last minute changes were made, so I don't remember the exact number, but quite a lot of them. Um, before I begin, just to, to remind you guys, I'm also a support engineer at Zabbix, a consultant and a trainer. And some of these changes that we're going to be covering are really quite requested there. A real lifesaver for many, they're a lifesaver for your security teams, maybe for your security policies. You can finally 100% abide by them. And this is really a power, powerful kind of improvement that makes Zabbix even more feasible for large scale corporate environments. So let's begin. So TLS support for front end communication with database and also for back end communication database. So I will be covering it in the next subtopic. So now we support encryption with the database from the front end side. Uses the already familiar, of course, TLS certificate encryption. Um, why encrypt at all? So maybe you're afraid of, that someone will be able to snoop on your data, on your communication data with the database. That is a risk um, that very much depends on how your you know, networking is set up, how accessible it is to external users to, you know, someone being able to sniff out that data and see what's going on. But essentially this is one less potential point of breach and this is good. So how, how to configure this? When you are doing the initial setup and I recognize this screen, this is the initial setup of Zabbix, you have a small checkbox over here, ELS encryption. So you enable it, you define, the TLS key file, certificate file, certificate authority file, and for PostgreSQL, you can enable or disable post verification also. And then you also can specify the cipher list, and I'm gonna talk about cipher list in another subsection. This is also a really nice feature. Currently, this is supported for PostgreSQL, as I already mentioned, and for MySQL. So that is quite nice. Uh, maybe we'll support this further on for some other backends, who knows? Who knows? But currently it is the way it is. So just to sum up, TLS certificate-based encryption supported for MySQL and PostgreSQL with host verification, that's that checkbox. Uh, the database service certificate can be checked by comparing the host name specified in the certificate with the name of the host to which it is connected. So we can kind of verify that you are who you say you are. If the TLS parameters point to files that are open for writing, which is generally bad, you will also receive a warning, which I think is also a great feature, stating that these files should be read only. They shouldn't be open for writing, because that's bad. 
next up, same deal, but for your uh, server backend. So server backend communication with a database. Once again, can now be encrypted. As all things uh, backend, we have to specify these encryption parameters in the server config files. And here you can see we have a bunch of new parameters going on, dbtls connect, uh, dbtls ca file, and so on. Um, also, you can specify the cipher. Essentially, it's the same thing that you could specify in the front end in those kind of input boxes that you saw. But now you can also do it on the back end in the config file manually. So a couple of example scenarios. Um, if we specify dbtls connect as required without specifying anything else, this will encrypt the connection to the DB without authenticating or verifying the host identity. So remember the host identity checkbox in the front end. Right now it's unchecked if we just set this to required. Then if we set this dbtls connect to verify full, what this will actually do, this will make the encrypted connection from the back end to the database with authenticating and also verifying the host identity. And in this case, we also have to, of course, specify the certificate authority file, which is specified over here. And there, of course, are some other modes that we can define over here and some other parameters, as you saw before. But this is just to make a comparison that, hey, this can be very simple if you know your security requirements are quite lax. And this can also be quite complex you know, if, if you have, maybe if you're a security engineer yourself or if you have security engineers breathing uh, over your neck, you know, saying that, hey, we need to specify a lot more things, we need to restrict some ciphers and so on, um, then this can be specified in more detail. You have the ability. And one of the things that you can specify are these here configurable ciphers. Uh, so if you need to restrict what kind of cipher suits are permitted in your environment for PLS encryption per component, which is really nice. Remember, we saw that cipher suit section in the um, front end when we were defining it, we saw just now in the config files. So you can specify those per component. We can override this for certificates, PSK, and combined. We can also override these for Zabbix get and Zabbix sender by passing the TLS cipher 13 or TLS cipher parameters. This depends on the library that you're using for encryption and the version of TLS. So there are two parameters for different TLS versions. So once again, you can select these ciphers based on your security policy, completely up to you how you select them, separate configuration parameters for TLS 1.3 and 1.2, and configurable for incoming and outgoing connections per component. Um, an additional note from my side, I, I'd say, and we actually note this and state this in our documentation, this is quite a complex um, feature. I don't recommend generally just messing with it around if you kind of have no clue about you know, these cipher suits and hey, any encryption is good encryption for you, then just, just leave it be, it's fine. Uh, but if you do have you know, maybe a, a security guy breathing over your neck or you yourself are well-versed in security, then yeah, definitely feel free to mess around with this. That, that's what it's there for. As I said, it's kind of a, for more advanced users, more advanced encryption. Next up, uh, we can take a look at these configuration parameters over here for ciphers. Um, as you can see, there are quite a lot of them uh, for TLS 1.3 and TLS 1.2. We have TLS Cypher Cert 13 and TLS Cypher Cert. Then we have separate uh, parameters for PSK encryptions and certificate encryptions. And for combined, that's TLS Cypher All over here at the bottom for both PSK and certificates. So you'll be able to see them in different places and different for different Zabbix components, but they're there. Just search for TLS and you'll be able to specify these. Next up, another feature that I think has been requested for quite a while, ability to mask your macros. And we didn't just you know, simply mask them. We did a bunch of other things also to improve this behavior. So it's not just only a visual thing. What this means is, if someone is looking over your shoulder, say, you know, you're in an open space, um, have a lot of traffic of, of, you know, people just walking all over the place, or maybe you're at home and you're afraid to show your um, SMP community to your wife or your kid, you know, or something like that. Hey, maybe they'll be able to access my networking equipment and, and mess things around and monitor it. I don't want it. So you can select secret text over here instead of text. 
and the values you can see will be displayed as kind of hidden, you know, star symbols over here. Um, so that's nice. No one's able to look over your shoulder and just kind of note what you're typing in. This can be done on every kind of macro that you are defining. And a couple of other notes, a couple of other things that are really nice with masked macros. So some of you that are maybe more familiar with Zabbix are maybe thinking, hey, but what if I, you know, clone um, a host or a template with these macros? I, I bet they haven't thought of that. I bet these Zabbix guys haven't thought of that. And it'll just be plain text and I'll be able to get this value that way. Um, we have thought of that actually. And if you attempt to clone a host or a template with a secret text macro, the values get reset. You can see this here warning message, the clone host contains user defined macros with type secret text. And hey, they're not available to someone who's cloning it. So they're still completely safe. Next up, if you are thinking that, all right, these guys thought of cloning uh, hosts or templates, but what about exporting the host or a template with macros on it? I bet I could work around it that way. No, not the case. We've also thought of that. When exporting the host or a template, the value of the secret macro is not exported. You can see it over here. You just see the type secret text and you don't actually see the value itself. Yeah, you see the macro name, which is perfectly fine, but the value is, is not available in the XML. So once again, that's another security hole that's been completely shut down. We, we closed it down, feel free to use it. And of course, um, another nice thing, if you are thinking of editing, you know, your macro, your secret macro, you hover over the value, you won't be able to edit it because once again, that's kind of a security hole that you don't want there. Uh, you can set the new value completely fresh, but you won't be able to continue from where you left off. So if you typed in an extremely long password, you know, that's missing one symbol, or you'll have to retype it or recopy it back there, which I think is a good thing. Next up, and I think this is also quite a big one, front-end password hashing improvements. So we replaced MD5, which is quite old and quite insecure, with Decrypt. And this has a lot of benefits. This, if your database gets compromised, those passwords are, are pretty safe. Don't worry about it at this point. So this is based on the Blowfish algorithm. Uh, this is a lot slower than MD5, and that's a good thing because you aren't able to hardware accelerate this and therefore you aren't able to brute force uh, your passwords. So the, in this case, something being slow is good because attackers can just, you know, spin their server farm up and just brute force these in, in a couple of hours. No, that's, that's not really possible with decrypt and that's a good thing. Uh, old MD5 hashes, are replaced with decrypt hashes after initial login. So we don't you know, force you to retype your password or something like that. We take a look when you perform the initial login and hey, it's still in the old MD5 hash format and we uh, replace it with a decrypt hash. This uses, this also has a unique salt value. Um, there is quite a complex logic of how this hash is calculated together with salts and all those things. But essentially this makes the current approach not feasible for rainbow table attacks, which could be another potential, another potential loophole for you know, compromising the database and then using rainbow tables to, hey, oh, maybe in a matter of days, get, get your passwords for you know, multiple users. And now it's, it's not possible. You will have to, well, of course, if you have infinite amount of time on, on your hands, you can do it, but um, no and the rehashing all of those things uh, with the unique salts, that's just not feasible. So rainbow tables are out of the question. Next up, out of the box support for SAML. Um, once again, nowadays with 5.0, this is completely out of the box. All you have to do, you have to configure some parameters on the SAML side. Then you have to configure some parameters in the front end. Once again, this is fully front end. You have the SAML section over, over here. Um, and just have to specify these parameters and you're ready to go. A um, Couple of notes though, a corresponding user must exist in Zabbix. However, its password will not be used. So we'll use the single sign-on to authenticate, but the user must still be there. You need to pre-configure the identity provider. Um, the 
correct parameters for, for how to pre-configure it are provided in our documentation. There are some notes over there, so take a look at that definitely. Default location for private key and certificate is located in UI conf certs. Uh, once again, this can be tweaked if, you know, this the front end thing, this here is not enough. You need to tweak some additional things, you can tweak them in the config files. And over here we have some additional uh, settings such as service provider key, service provider certificate, identity provider certificate, and some additional settings. They can be configured in Zabbix, conf, PHP. Um, so you can crack it open and configure it, but for, I think, your average user, I'm thinking this will be enough, the, the front end uh, configuration and configuration of the identity provider and you're good to go. Next up, more security on the item level. Blacklisting and whitelisting of item keys. Essentially, we can restrict the execution of item keys per agent. We have a couple of new uh, configuration parameters that we can use. Um, we can specify individual keys or use wildcards, and I'll show you how to configure it in a moment. I'll show you, for example, configuration file and what's the output actually when we configure those things. So we have allow key and we have deny key, and the rule check stops after the first match. So if we have deny key first, then allow key, which maybe includes something that's including the wildcard of the deny key, the deny key will take precedence. You will see an example with this, this will make more sense. Allow key can be used only if deny key is specified. You cannot use allow key on its own to receive an error message um, when starting at the agent. If a specific item key is disallowed in the agent config, the item will turn unsupported. So you'll just see unsupported item key in the front end. Zabbix agent with the print command line option will not show keys that are not allowed. So that's another good thing. We've also thought about those command line tools a little bit. Zabbix agent with the test option will return unsupported item key for keys that are not allowed based on these parameters. So both test and print work with this, take this into account. And let's take a look at some of the examples. So deconfiguration order matters. Remember, first match is everything. So in this case, I have system.run. The Nike, that's the first parameter that I have defined sequentially in my config file with the wildcard. And you can use wildcard in these. In these. So system.run, um, essentially everything is denied for system.run. But afterwards, I specify allow key, hey, system.run, some list of files in, in a directory. Even though I specified allow key over here, it's still unsupported because first, it matches the system.run with the wildcard over here, denying it. So first match is king in this case. If you wish to fix it, this is how to fix it. Specify the allow key first and then the deny key. Hey, system.run ls something is allowed. Any other system.run commands are denied. Makes sense. So you have to be careful with this because by default in the agent config file, at least currently with what I've been working, the the deny key is first and the allow key is second. So don't be afraid with you know, messing around with that order and, and replacing these things. Because that has to be done in, in this specific scenario. Next up, ODBC improvements. ODBC uh, connection string support. So we have improved ODBC checks. Another way to specify a connection string. So instead of using the DSN, you can now specify this on the item key level for ODBC keys. We've added a new parameter and we've made the DSN parameter optional actually. So um, first a couple of notes and then let's take a look at that key, how it looks. So in some cases, users may not have access to the ODBC.ini file. It happens sometimes security restrictions or, or things like that. Maybe only a specific admin can edit this. And connection string works around that by defining the connection parameters on the item level. So instead of using the odbc.ini, specify the DSNs there, we can use it per item, which is really nice. This is the whole gist of this feature. This is why it's there. Additional security and additional flexibility. In this item key, we have to specify either DSN or connection string. If both are present, the DSN will be ignored. We'll just use that connection string. And the connection string may also contain driver specific arguments. Let's take a look at how it looks. So we have the alt key up top, ODB, ODBC select. We can see that the DSN uh, over here is 
it's not an optional parameter, it's mandatory. The new key, as you can see, DSN is optional. And we have a new parameter connection string, which is also optional. So we have to specify one of these. That's what you have to do. And as per previous slide, if you specified both of these, the DSN and the connection string, um, then the connection string will be used. If you specified only DSN, then we will use the DSN from the ODPC.ini. And an example of connection string, here we're pointing towards the corresponding driver, then the database, then the server, then the port. So we simplify things by quite a bit. We've added additional security because, like I said, you don't need to poke and prod that DSN file, that ODBC.ini file with the DSNs in it. Um, don't need to ask maybe another admin to do it for you if you don't have any access and so on. So I think this makes things a bit more simple and a bit more secure. Legacy encryption and library support dropped. So we've actually dropped support for embed TLS. Why? Because the supported embed TLS version has reached the end of life for a while and we consider that a security hole. So what we actually did, we kind of asked around both our support engineers and our community members, you know, if you're using embed TLS and how vital it is for you. And the only thing that we heard were, was the chirping of the birds. So no response whatsoever, no, or no one was interested in this. So we thought, hey, let's free up some development overhead. Let's also make things more secure by dropping the support for this year version because it's reached end of life. Um, and let's focus on OpenSSL and GNU TLS. Let's focus on these two core libraries to provide better product for them instead of, you know, kind of going in with, with kind of very niche products that no one actually responded that they're using. So this is why we dropped it. Audit log get. So security improvements have also impacted our API. We have a new object and a new method. We have a new audit log object and audit log.get method. Uh, I think this is really, really nice. And this is kind of filling a missing piece with our API because usually, you know, when you ask us about our API, uh, I and my colleagues are 100% are confident, hey, you can do anything and everything with the API. Well, it turns out there was a missing piece of the puzzle. That's audit log.get. And over here, I have a screenshot of mine, uh, of the uh, call itself that I executed, audit log.get and the response that I received. So all of this can be filtered um, and sorted in a couple of ways. I'll mention them here. Um, and you can then work with that response and do a bunch of interesting things. Maybe, maybe you can monitor that response via Zabbix also. Um, so we can filter by audit IDs and or user IDs. We have the ability to search the, by the old value and the new value. The object contains information about action type, resource type, IP address, resource IDs, names and other details. So everything that you may ever need. Um, and this can be potentially very useful. For example, you're getting these things you know, via an API script or something like that. You're formatting it, parsing it, processing it, whatever. And, and Zabbix is monitoring that output actually. And it's notifying you that, hey, someone changed something that they shouldn't have changed. Or you know, there's a potential breach because a lot of things have been changed or, or something like that. So quite useful to monitor Zabbix itself to maybe sort by, search by, and so on to detect misconfigurations, breaches, things like that. Um, I, I think that, like I said, this is a missing, missing piece of the puzzle and this is quite useful. HTTP proxy in webhooks. Uh, another security improvement. Webhooks is quite a fresh functionality. Um, this is how our out-of-the-box integrations are created nowadays. Um, and we've added the ability to pass those integrations to, through an HTTP proxy. This is quite simple. When you're defining a new media type of type webhook, you just add this here HTTP proxy uh, parameter and you specify the proxy based on this, this here syntax. Um, if you're looking for documentation, take a look at, a, take a look at, it, at HTTP agent. Um, over there in the HTTP agent section, essentially it's the same logic over there as it is for webhooks. So very similar to those who have been using these HTTP proxies with your agents, this will be quite familiar. Um, next up, last but not least, so I had 12 topics after all, not 11. Um, last minute changes, um, DB character set check. So, as many of you probably already know, hopefully already know, because we've been kind of preaching this as a mantra, the support team, um, 
you need to use the correct character set and the collect, uh, correct collation when you're setting up the Zabbix uh, database. And nowadays, we'll actually be checking these. We'll be checking on the initial setup and we'll be checking these if you already have an existing instance and you've upgraded to 5.0, why this matters. So here I have an example. I have three hosts, ABC, all capital letters, ABC, only uppercase A, and ABC, uppercase A, and uppercase C. As you know, Zabbix should support all of these just fine. Zabbix is case sensitive. It can work with these. Um, as you can see, these also have different host IDs. So they're different hosts. Host ID is you know, the primary key, so everything should be fine. But if I don't specify character set, uh, correct character set and or collation, what could happen, a couple, of, a couple of different SQL errors in the front end. And also, for example, when over here, this is what I attempted on a fresh 5.0 instance of my own. I attempted to add a template, one of these hosts, so either one of these ABCs. And when I clicked update, I received this here error message, host ABC already exists. Under the hood, if you take a look at the source code, there actually is a uniqueness check for this and that's why it, it, it doesn't work. Um, it will give you some kind of a bogus error message and, and so on. So you have to be careful with that character set. The error message will look like this if it's wrong and support the character set or collation for specific tables and then you have to fix it. Um, the ways to fix it are out there. Um, we can either provide them to you if you wish, you know, as, as a part of your support agreement or they're out there uh, in the community uh, resources, how to fix it for the existing instances. But yeah, you also are able to see this in the log files, which is nice. But the bad thing about this um, is, and I don't think we should talk about why this matters because I already talked about it, but the benefits of this is if you are running the query to fix the collation on, you know, already a database that's already grown in size over time to terabytes maybe. That query is going to take some time. It's good to catch this issue and fix it as soon as possible. So that's why it's quite important for us and I think it's, it's good for you. Data integrity is part of security and, and this kind of makes sure that the data integrity is preserved when you're setting up your Zabbix instance. So those are all 12 features that I wanted to cover. Um, thank you guys. And let's see if you have some questions. I think uh, Dmitry is going to assist me with this one. Sure, I will. And we do have a question. So the first one is, um, I'm not surprised we have a question like this. So are there any performance degradation if the TLS is used to connect to the database? So front end and server communication with DB. Um, not that we know though, as seen with other components with DLS, there is some performance overhead, but um, to us, we still haven't established like a, you know, a direct example of how large it is and how does it actually impact you. So there probably is, but we're still kind of trying to figure out if it's noticeable, if it's not noticeable and how does it affect you. All right, the next one is, uh, can we use a password encrypted TLS certificate host key file for the Zabbix server or the Zabbix agent? You will need to hand me that in in writing. Um, so okay. password encrypted. I think oh. I can answer that we yeah, go ahead. Can, cannot yet. If we're talking about uh, private key encryption with a passphrase. So the problem is that usually like there should be some way where from get this passphrase. So yeah, not yet. I think um, now that we have all of these kind of baseline security things established, um, there is, and, and maybe Alexi can later on chime in on this. So this is kind of a baseline, a lot of new things for us, and then based on feature requests and, you know, bug reports, things like that, just the general buzz in the community will be looking at it and seeing what we've missed out on um, some other maybe minor pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. All right. Um, next one. Will the existing MD5 passwords uh, be hashed to the bcrypt after an upgrade? Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. This was this was covered in the slides after the initial login. Yeah. You, you do the initial login and it's rehashed in bcrypt. Um, how it's checked if you're interested in the technicalities. If I'm not mistaken, um, the sizes of uh, the passwords are different, so it checks if the size of the hashes are different, not the passwords. If you still have the hash of the old size, that means you're using MD5, that means it should be rehashed 
if it's the new size of you know the decrypt then you're using decrypt and you're all good all right and the last one about uh, some authentication in the future will it be possible to auto provision zabbix users instead of having to have them exist ahead of the time once again, I think this is more of a question to Alexi, but from my side, from what I've seen in ZBX Next and maybe internal discussion, and hopefully this doesn't contradict what Alexi is going to maybe answer uh, in the Q&A or, or directly later on. I've heard a lot of buzz about this because you know this is the same deal for uh, LDAP, um, and this has been requested for quite a while. And from based on the buzz that this has generated, I'd say that this is a matter of time when the feature is coming. So it should be there at some point, I think. That would be my guess as, you know, as a, an internal user. Yeah, uh, if that's the last one, correct? No more? Yep, that, that was the last one. So thank you once again for your presentation. Yeah, thank you guys. Um, now the awkward moment of moving on with the next presenter. Um, let me take a deep breath, answering all of your questions. Um, and actually, no, for the, last, uh, the next presenter, not the last one, is um, another colleague of mine, another support engineer. Um, he'll be talking about a very nice, a very interesting topic. Alexi also mentioned it. He'll be talking about databases, the big spooky databases. Specifically, he'll be talking about Timescale AB. Um, we've made some improvements and some changes with it. And let my fellow colleague, support engineer, consultant trainer, Alexander petrov Gorilov, cover it. So welcome, Alexanders or Alexander, depending what language are you speaking. Oh, hello everyone uh, yep now it's getting fine now you can actually see me and let me just share my screen right now so you can actually see what's all the big fuzz about so I'm gonna talk about upgrading Zabbix but not just your usual uh, upgrade to the database you use but actually to upgrading to timescale DB but probably the first question that you might have when there is a talk about upgrade is why to upgrade? Why to upgrade at all? Well, uh, even though you can talk about versions of Zabbix like let's say uh, the same model of uh, the same car, but still of course with the newer version, with the new uh, model, new version coming along, the Zabbix improves. It improves, it improves stability, performance, security, it adds new features. And of course, you've heard today about a lot of new features that are available in 5.0, and I'm absolutely sure you would like to use all of those features, see how do they work, and of course, test them out, play them out, and maybe then, and I hope you do, and I really trust you will do, eventually update your current production environments too to the 5.0. Uh, and of course the improvements and well again I mentioned improvements three times so you can know that we are improving each time uh, the question is also in the life cycle so with each newer version you get a new long-term support which will last again for the future for the next five years with the next release so which version to choose? Well, of course, the version 5.0, the version that we are uh, presenting to you all, uh, well, this meetup, and of course, with all the features we have shown you already. So, uh, Alex, I mentioned that now the timescale to be supported, and that will be the main uh, thing that I will be looking at. I will talk about a bit the timescale to be itself, and of course, uh, about how to actually upgrade the timescale DB. So first things first, let's look at the timescale DB. Is this the same absolutely thing as PostgreSQL or is it something completely different and how do they work all together? So what is timescale DB? Timescale DB is a PostgreSQL extension, which means that, well, it's based on the same old PostgreSQL, but it's not absolutely the same thing. So, uh, what is timescale to be? Uh, it's an extension that adds time series based performance and basically data management optimizations to a regular PostgreSQL database. 
uh, in the terms of Zabbix, it enhances performance quite, quite enormously. And of course, it also compresses the data starting with 5.0. And we will, of course, look at the uh, benchmarks provided so you can actually see with your own eyes how efficient it is. So uh, the main architecture solution of the timescale DB itself is, of course, uh, the hyper tables. And if we're talking about the hyper tables, well, as the name suggests, you can just imagine them uh, exactly as a big, enormous tables that contain all the information that you are planning to walk through in your database through all the space and time that, of course, is included in the table, is stored in the table, and can be seen in the table. And uh, since it's a hyper table, everything, all the uh, alterings, uh, inserts that you do with your data will be uh, going through that specific hyper table. And a bit deeper down, a bit more inside, the hyper table consists of the chunks, which can be, uh, well, quite closely compared to the partitions themselves. And of course, uh, each chunk, or if, again, it's more better sounding, each partition, of the hyper table uh, corresponds to a specific time interval and the region of this partition's case space. So you can actually take the info from that chunk, uh, whatever info you might need, uh, might need to see uh, in your Zabbix or in, of course, other installations. So, okay, we get the appropriate, uh, well, uh, imagery of what timescale DB is, so it's some kind of a normal, enormous table that contains some chunks, but still, why? Why just because it's a normal table? No. Uh, the first thing first, as I said already, it's an extension, so you don't need and you won't need any extra hardware, no additional virtual machines, or any other changes to uh, actually use it. You will still be using basically uh, your own, uh, you, your PostgreSQL if you ever used it, or if not, well, then now you will start using PostgreSQL, may, maybe. And of course, all the re relevant to the PostgreSQL operations and queries. It leaves your database, uh, your code, uh, absolutely intact. So you get the same old Zabbix that you are using. Well, correctly to say, same new Zabbix you will be using. And of course, the performance, the main thing that we always are interested in when we are talking about infrastructure changes, about monitoring a lot of data, about collect, collecting a lot of values per second. So, and TimescaleDB gives us performance, performance and improvements for Zabbix History Sinker and Housekeeper too. But not only that, also it saves us a lot of space, but all in the side. So let's take a look at actually how uh, performance looks like. So if we're talking about vanilla PostgreSQL, you might have read our uh, blog and seen already these graphs, but I will, don't worry, I will show you the actual uh, experimental data that I performed for you. So vanilla PostgreSQL gives you quite a lot. Of course, it should be an optimized PostgreSQL, at least a bit, and you will be able to collect a lot of values. But as you can see, eventually they will drop down, for example, after restart. With TimescaleDB, you get consistency. You get consistency and you get a lot more values per second are inserted in your database in timely manner without spikes. Everything goes smoothly in and you can see all the information again as soon as smoothly as well you expect it to be. So if we take a look at the direct comparison of how can it look like, well, you can see that eventually PostgreSQL falls down, down, and a bit more down. But the time scale to be keeps it steady, no big drops, uh, no big jumps. Everything is smooth, just as it needs to be. So I also mentioned compression, didn't I? And the timescale to be compression, which is uh, well, relatively new feature to the uh, timescale to be uh, itself. And well, I've tested myself and you can see some examples of the tests uh, that were provided by uh, TimescaleDB community and you can see that storage savings can reach up to 90%. So that's a lot. And for example, if your database is one terabyte, reducing to just 100 gigabytes is quite the difference. Uh, and of course, it is quite noticeable difference. You will save a lot on the storage uh, expenses themselves. So how does compression works? How can it uh, make 
uh, well, relatively disappear uh, 900, for example, uh, gigabytes of data. Well, uh, in short, it basically turns all your tables uh, not in uh, something that you usually see when you, for example, log in into your Zobbix database and execute some query like select all from well, some table. It basically converts the table into one single quite, quite long row that will collect all the values that uh, you will be able to get back to see. You won't be able to do uh, updates or, for example, answers with that data. Uh, well, at least if you don't uncompress it back. But still, if you just want to see that data, like for example, uh, to see how it does it looks like, well, you will be able to do that. So again, let's summarize this up. Why timescale the why timescale to be? Because it is still SQL. So it supports all SQL operations. It is compatible with existing PostgreSQL ecosystem and tooling. So if you use any, for example, for your clusters and query execution, you will still be able to use them since it's still basically uh, the same PostgreSQL in terms of operations and queries. It is quite transparent in terms of times and space partitioning uh, for both scaling up uh, on a single node. And of course, it is still quite accessible for the newcomers. And there's quite some uh, documentation uh, on the Postgres itself, TimescaleDB, and of course, uh, around just Google surfing. So you won't get lost completely if you will start experimenting by and on your own. So, okay, uh, let's say we, we decided that we want to upgrade, we want to know what to do, what, so now the next question is what to actually upgrade to start using it. I would say everything, but not exactly and not obligatory, actually everything. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if you use some older uh, PostgreSQL version, then you will absolutely need to update also the database um, to at least 9.6 version of PostgreSQL. And if you want to also use compression, you will need to go even further and upgrade your PostgreSQL to the version at least 10.2. Uh, but I hope you don't use very, uh, very ancient versions of Postgres. So I trust in you guys and I trust you don't need to upgrade your database. So if you use, for example, at least 10.2 and you want to use compression and you want to use timescale to be, then well, you're all set up and you don't need to upgrade uh, agents and the database itself. Why don't you need to upgrade agents? Well, quite simply because they're still, and well, I really hope they will be forever, uh, backward compatible, but of course, without uh, the new features on the older agents. So you need to remember that. But yeah, backward compatibility is there and all the agents until one, uh, 1.4 are supported in terms of backward compatibility. So, okay, a lot of talking about that. So how to actually upgrade? Okay, we got it. TimescaleDB looks cool, looks promising. Uh, so what do we need to do and how to do that? Uh, we all know that upgrading Zabbix and especially upgrading databases can be quite stressful. And it's always a good question to what to actually do first. And I've got you covered with that. And I will, of course, show you how to do it just right now. So I used a simple, uh, well, in my opinion, average setup. Uh, it's CentOS 7, the one that I see the most around. PostgreSQL 9.6, I'm not quite sure it's the one that's most popular, but again, I see it, seen it quite a lot in different requests. Uh, so I decided to, well, let it be my starting point. Of course, Zabbix Server 4.0, because until certain point, it was the newest version you could get uh, in terms of long-term support. Uh, of course, the newest exactly was 4.4. And I took your average her hardware. Well, to be honest, it was a bit lower than average, so I can actually see will it will be able to handle whatever I'm going to do with it. And the first thing I did uh, af after, of course, the installation of 4.0 is uh, upgraded Postgres SQL. So why did I need it? Because I actually had 9.6 and compression is not supported in 9.6, so I needed to upgrade it. And I decided why not, uh, I will upgrade to the latest version, the version 12 of PostgreSQL. 
So the first thing first, you need to get the repo for the version you will be using. You can get it, of course, on the Postgres. Uh, there actually have quite a nice menu that uh, won't leave you lost in terms of downloads. You will find where to download it. And then you, of course, run uh, you install Postgres SQL. But uh, you might notice, hey, you said you already had Postgres SQL. That's right. So I will actually, after this installation, we'll have two versions on my system, the Postgres SQL 9.6 and Postgres SQL 12. So I will stop the older one. Uh, so before you actually start to upgrade in production, remember, then you will need to stop the Zobbix server and the database. So if you are very uh, worrying about your data, try to find the time where it's appropriate to stop those things. And then uh, after stopping the older one, I initialized the new one. So I started the 12th version and actually started the migration of the data. It works also uh, for the clusters themselves. And the command is just as you see it on the slide. It upgraded, it migrated the data smoothly without actually any errors. But remember, it's migration of the data. It won't be fast if your database is already enormous. So plan your time accordingly. And then start the new instance. Uh, I'm not starting the older one. I'm starting only the new one since the data is migrated and I see, hey, Zabbix uh, continues to work. That means upgrade is fine. I can get up to all the menus, see all the data, everything is in place. So now time to back up everything. Uh, well, it's a good idea to actually back up everything before migration, but uh, if you're sure in Postgres and as was I, you can back up after that. So read the release notes, take note of the important changes, what have changed, maybe uh, something in the schema, maybe something in how does it work. Maybe something will stop working like it was before. Make sure to know what exactly you are doing with your system. And they make a Zabbix database backup uh, in the way that you, well, prefer to do it, uh, at least in the simple PG dump DB name to DB name backup file. Or if, for example, you don't care about the uh, history information for some reason and you want to do things absolutely fast, well then just back up the configuration files so you can start not completely from scratch with losing all the data but still keeping on your uh, server, agent configurations, your scripts and so on and so on, whatever was done, especially in the front end if you maybe some did some branding or uh, customizations. So after that is done, we have a backup. We are brave enough to do the uh, Next part of the upgrade, stop the Zabbix server. And as you can guess, data won't be flowing in. So again, plan your time accordingly and upgrade your current repository package. Uh, if you don't know where to find the link, it's in the documentation, of course. It's uh, also the instructions quite close, uh, not so compiled to how to do that also are available in our documentation. And then start upgrading the Zabbix components. So upgrade your Zabbix server and upgrade your Zabbix agent. And you might notice front end is not yet mentioned. That's because uh, if you're upgrading from the older version, upgrading the front end is a bit different than you used to while you were upgrading, for example, uh, let's say from 3.0 to 4.0, the instructions quite change. So you will need to remove the old front end. So again, if you had any customizations, and I hope you listen to me and did a backup of the files of the front end. So you can just copy and paste whatever you changed or well, at least know what you need to change. So then install the SCL repository. Now you install CentOS release SCL. Why do you need it? Well, basically, uh, since the front end will use the newer PHP, uh, as it was already mentioned, the PHP 7.2, and you might need your older version PHP for something else. Uh, SCL really allows you to use uh, basically both in terms of what software will use what. And then go to the repos, the Zabbix repo file. <coughs> I'm sorry, a bit out of breath. And edit uh, the file by uh, changing uh, the enabled to one instead of zero. So when you will install it, you will see that it's zero by default. And install the new front end packages. Uh, by executing for the progress for the Postgres Yum install Zabbix web Postgres SQL SCL. Don't forget to update the time zone uh, as well you already know you did for the older versions. It's the same, but maybe you will be surprised a bit by how actually files look like. 
and then start and enable PHP FPM service. Why? Because we have a newer PHP and well, it works a bit more efficiently thanks to the FPM itself. And restart the Apache to make the changes actually happen. So after that, the next step, install time scale DB. How to do that? It's actually pretty simple. Uh, just go to the link you see in the slides. Well, we add something to the repo, to the scam time scale DB repo, and then install uh, basically the time scale uh, PostgreSQL for uh, your system. And well, that's not all. It will be installed, of course, but you still need to tune your database. And for that, you will need to execute timescale to be tuned. And you need to provide specifically for this command. It's actually the information about that is not provided on the timescale to be page itself. So take a note on this slide, uh, execute timescale to be and the home path directory to your configuration file. It actually uh, makes changes to your configuration. Um, sometimes scale to be optimizations. So don't just blindly uh, agree with everything it does. Uh, it might break uh, some parts of how your Zabbix works. So for example, if you have a lot of polars, uh, like let's say hundreds of them, uh, default time scale to be connections are just hundred and it make, uh, and it can actually interfere with how your Zabbix performs. So pay attention before changing something. And one important note, uh, the database schema changes a bit uh, when talking about upgrade from 4.0 to 5.0 in terms of Zabbix. So before actually doing something with the DB, uh, it's a better idea to start a Zabbix server to update the DB schema. And after it is done, stop your Zabbix server. Again, not to flow in the data and enable the timescale DB extension for your uh, Zabbix database. You will see an output that shows you, hey, it's been enabled. And if it was successfully enabled, run the timescale DB SQL script that is located in database Postgres SQL or basically in the default directory uh, where the Zabbix schema usually is located. But in terms of Postgres SQL, it will be user share Zabbix server Postgres SQL 5.0.0. And just cut the timescale DB SQL to your Zabbix database and wait. And just sit there and wait, don't you worry, it will be fine, uh, but it will take time and it might take quite a lot of time because the bigger your database is, uh, the bigger your history tables are where all the data is, well, the more times it obviously will take. So uh, be sure to hold it uh, calmly together, not thinking about, well, my database is probably uh, gone far by now. I'm pretty, I'm sure it won't be. And when uh, the migration will be finished, start the Zabbix server. How will you know it was successful? Well, you will see the output that looks plus minus something like that. Uh, but again, if you will see that uh, history tables were successfully uh, change to be the hyper tables the time scale to be uses. Uh, and you forgot actually to start the Zabbix uh, before starting to convert uh, tables to hyper tables. You will see that some of them failed. Don't worry, you can actually update this uh, schema still and then just run again the script and it will do whatever it needs to do. Now basically convert what is left to the hyper tables to make them sure they work perfectly as needed. And check the housekeeper settings. Why? Because uh, the uh, script itself, the conversion changes uh, the uh, history and trend period keeping in terms of how it is kept and how it is cleaned by the housekeeper. And since we are, have enabled compression, and again, it is not uh, by default in the settings, it will be enabled now and you will see compressed records older than seven days. And seven days, remember that it's the uh, minimum possible term currently uh, to compress the data. So you cannot, for example, compress the data just for yesterday. And what's next? Enjoy the monitoring, of course. But you're probably wondering, and what will I enjoy? What, will it be efficient? Well, let's take a look at the results we achieved. And I will show off you something of my homework. So performance before, uh, I mean, it was quite an average setup. So if you don't notice something, trust me, you will. It was around uh, 
values per second flowing in. After I've upgraded it, it actually held to 2.7 uh, thousand values per second. So in terms of percentage, that's about uh, 20 more percent more efficient on an older hardware. If you had, for example, not like me, but uh, uh, good drives, uh, good uh, and normal RAM, you would get more than those 20%. And even uh, truly, if your Zabbix system is already loaded, 20% is a lot since you don't need basically to change any hardware. What about the mentioned uh, history syncing and housekeeper? So before the upgrade, they were quite loaded, uh, jumping uh, occasionally up to 100%, making Zabbix choke. But with timescale DB, we see that everything changed when the, the timescale DB came uh, to our services, to our savior and history syncer basically started to take a vacation uh, because it was loaded only 20% and still the data was flowing in even more efficient than it was before. So database size before. Uh, just to mention, uh, I've mentioned earlier that 90% is possible. It is possible, it was 90%, but because it took quite some time, uh, the after screenshots were made a bit later and the data was flowing in quite enormously. So you will see around 70%, but trust me, it was 90. So let's take a look. We had, I had two databases, one 30 gigabytes and other 300 gigabytes. After uh, the compression, I mean, the data is basically, it is there, but now uh, the 30 gigabyte database uh, takes only around six gigabyte, but gigabyte, sorry. Uh, but actually uh, after the upgrade, it was uh, around three and the 300 gigabyte database now takes only 65 gigabyte while in truth it was around 40 when uh, the upgrade finished. So before you actually go running and upgrade uh, all your PostgreSQL to the time scale DB, it's still partly experimental. So cool off a bit, don't throw out all your databases. Uh, you might encounter things that we haven't heard about, you haven't heard about, and it might take some time to solve them. But if you have quite a deductive mind and you're open to experiments, well, sure then, why not try it? It is efficient as you see. With the compressed chunks, uh, you cannot uh, execute any operations, well, not any, uh, operations like inserts, deletes, and updates. So you can view, of course, them. You can uh, basically select them to see them, but you cannot delete them until you uncompress the chunk back. So what about other databases? Do you want to say that we need to drop the MySQL or drop the, I don't know, MariaDB uh, fork? Uh, forget about Oracle. No, absolutely not. You still need to work with the databases you know how to work with. So, plus again, partitioning still is there. It still is very efficient. Of course, it doesn't compress the data, but it's still very efficient in terms of performance. So, uh, yeah, still, uh, of course, use the databases you can and know how to work with. Uh, except IBM DB2, because for 5.0 it got dropped. Don't use that. You will need to, well, change something. Sorry for that. And uh, what else about the databases? Can I migrate? I'm pretty sure, I didn't actually check the questions, but I'm absolutely sure there's a lot of questions like how can now I instantly migrate my MySQL database to the PostgreSQL because, well, you know why. Well, uh, there are ways, there are tools. One of the tools is actually named MySQL to PostgreSQL. So naming is even obvious than uh, the search you will be typing in. So there are tools and of course you can also contact our support and uh, we will try to assist you in that way that we will be able to. And remember, uh, this was just an average setup. With different setups, uh, things can go differently. So you need to remember that. And I cannot uh, promise that for everyone that will be as easy as smoothly as it was for me. Well, but I do hope it will for you. So thank you for your attention. I really do hope that was interesting for you. Uh, of course, I'm ready for the questions and thank you again. Thank you, Alex. Um, that was quite interesting. 
Well, always nice to see some database uh, performance value things like that, um, because it is actually so useful for larger instances. So we have quite a lot of questions as you predicted. Um, so let me start you off with, are the timescale DB compression savings generic or were those figures actually obtained by someone using Zabbix version five with it? No, uh, that's absolutely basically generic data. Uh, it w I was using 4.0 before that quite extensively. It was heavily loaded and I did compress only after the upgrade. So absolutely real values, nothing. Okay, so real values with version 5. Okay, um, second question. Should, oh yeah, of course. Should MySQL and MariaDB users migrate to PostgreSQL timescale DB? Is it possible or some data will be lost? Uh, overall, uh, it is possible. But the thing is, uh, I've seen some experiences of our own customers. It's not always that simple. It doesn't go that smoothly. So absolutely, you can try to migrate as long as you know uh, what are you doing and how to know the issues that most certainly will raise there. But if you, again, uh, know how to work with MySQL, you know how to partition the database, you know how to do it uh, basically efficiently, maybe you should work uh, with MySQL still. Again, TimescaleDB is still a bit experimental. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Next up, will that upgrade work from version 11 to 12? Uh, even if you're already using timescale DB? Uh, well, that's actually a good question. I haven't tried. Uh, the only thing I haven't tried is upgrading timescale DB, uh, timescale DB Postgres to another timescale DB Postgres. Uh, I expect it will, but don't want to get any promises since I haven't tested all the options. As you can imagine, there's quite a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So it actually covers, I guess, um, the same, uh, I'm not sure if it's timescale DB or Zabbix question, but the question is, are the same steps in other versions to perform the upgrade? Are, are the same uh, you mean the DB upgrade or the Zabbix upgrade? But I want uh, to receive uh, any details. Maybe you can talk about both. I mean, uh, well, in terms of PostgreSQL, uh, I've checked different versions. Uh, I was quite curious. And basically, yeah, you can upgrade PostgreSQL from the older versions to the newer versions quite in the same way because uh, the migration of the data is actually built in in PostgreSQL. So they covered it pretty much nicely and there shouldn't be any issues. In terms of Zabbix, well, I actually recommend to visit our webinar in terms of how to upgrade because all the possible steps depending on the versions are quite nicely covered there and uh, it actually takes almost an hour to cover them and I don't have that much time. But yeah, it's still easy. That's what I can say uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, two more. Should everyone just migrate to PostgreSQL timescale DB? Um, I wish I could say, yeah, yeah, absolutely, guys, just do it, do it right now. But no, again, it's still experimental. Uh, I've seen some issues in terms of, uh, in terms of memory usage uh, that comes not from Zabbix itself, but uh, from uh, more of the architecture of PostgreSQL. And sometimes, on rare occasions, there's quite some things uh, needed to be remembered but you might be out of memory just uh, when trying to make a restart. And of course we are working on those and uh, I hope it will be solved in some way or another quite soon. But I cannot say that if you will, you will 100% surely win. It depends on uh, the scale of your Zabbix. It depends on how much metrics you are collecting. It depends on how often uh, you update things and so on. A lot of things to consider first before actually making that upgrade or change. All right, and the last one. Yeah, sorry we're hammering you with questions right now, but this is the last one. Um, what level of compression is supported? Uh, what level of compression? I actually used myself uh, the default one since it is provided by the script itself, but you can absolutely change uh, the terms of the compression and like how old should be the data and uh, how you will compress it. So 
I could not clearly comment on it. I haven't tried all the options. So I would say, uh, the default, the time scale, the B1, uh, you should check out the script itself. All right. And that's all. Thank you a lot. I think this was very informative. Once again, sorry that we hammered you with questions, but hey, you're talking about databases. What did you expect? Yep. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Next up, um, our last speech for this year meetup. Um, finally, someone not from the support team is going to be talking. Um, so to those of you to whom this maybe is a bit uh, alien and too technical, this is going to be uh, quite interesting. So next up, Sergey Sorokin, Business Development Director from Zabbix, is going to cover Zabbix trainings and courses because 5.0 came out and some changes have been made, of course. So, Sergey, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, great to see so many people um, here. And I, I really believe that the team that you were presenting to, to you uh, just, just before me is, is a very talented one and is very knowledgeable in Zabbix. So what I want to say is that <clears throat> actually if, if you want to get the same level of knowledge or get very close on that, so um, Zabbix training program is, is a one stop for you. Uh, where you can uh, learn and, uh, and get uh, as, as many, uh, let's say, ideas, uh, experience, and, uh, and knowledge from our trainers in a pretty short uh, time. So uh, let's start with the Zabbix 5.0 uh, training program. So um, training courses. Uh, as, as you might know, uh, currently there are... Um, four uh, training courses, Zabbix certified uh, user, Zabbix certified specialist, professional expert. And that was uh, in, in the same way for, for many years. Um, so what challenges we were facing? Uh, as uh, you saw from the previous presentations, it's, uh, there are more functionality. We had Zabbix 4.4, 4.2, 5.0 out. Uh, Zabbix uh, training is, is pretty condensed. So there are a lot of topics presented in, in that, those days. And uh, of course, we, we want to achieve even better quality. So just maybe a, a short kind of a, a question is like, which, which actually version of Zabbix you're certified for? If, if you have that uh, kind of a Zabbix certificate, please let us know what, what actually, um, uh, you currently have on your hands. So it's maybe uh, will be easier for me just uh, to, to, uh, to, to make a great offer for you. Um, okay, so uh, this, this poll will not be for, for a long time and uh, I will close it uh, pretty, pretty soon to, to continue. So if, if you are here, just uh, make a click and, and select the version that, that you are currently certified for. Um, okay, so... Um, Probably uh, because I see that activity is going on and there are, um, okay, uh, it's like 50% of the people don't have any training uh, from, from Zabbix. So let me continue while you can still uh, vote on this. So what's coming up uh, in, in Zabbix uh, 5.0? Five, five Actually, we have the same training courses. Now those training courses are called major. So the same uh, courses will st stay there. Um, but it's going to be a new duration. Um, it's going to be, sorry, it's going to be uh, five days uh, instead of three days for Zabbix Certified Specialist. So it's one week of Zabbix Certified Specialist training. It's going to be three days for professional instead of current two days. And it's going to be five days for um, Zabbix Expert instead of... Um, current uh, three days. Okay, I'll end, Paul. Um, so, um, courses pre-requirements are staying the same. For those who have never attended Zabbix courses, I may just repeat that attending Zabbix user course does not require anything. So, it's just an introduction course to the Zabbix where you don't really need to do uh, or to have any knowledge. Uh, if we're talking about a certified specialist course, 
again, uh, formally it does not require any, uh, let's say, uh, or it doesn't have any pre-requirements except for, uh, let's say, advanced computer literacy and basic knowledge of operating system. And now if you were looking at the professional training course, then uh, and a student must um, uh, kind of uh, hold a Zabbik certified specialist exam or attendance certificate. For the uh, Zabbik certified expert, it's becoming even, uh, let's say, uh, higher requirements. A person must hold a Zabbik certified professional exam. So if you did not pass a professional exam, you are not allowed to attend this expert course. So uh, pre requirements for exam are the same. So again, for the user, you may decide to arrive for exam without attending a course, without having any other courses. You just call our sales uh, or our partners, training partners, agree on the time and date, and you just uh, go for the exam straight away. Uh, the same goes to the specialist course. I'm sorry, to the specialist exam, just straightforward. You let us know that you want to pass the exam. We'll uh, provide a timing for you, good timing, and you are good to go. If we're talking about professional uh, exam, then in this case, you need to hold a specialist exam. And only after that, you can um, attend professional exam. What goes to the Zabbik certified expert, there is actually no separate exam for Zabbik certified expert. So you must attend uh, expert course and only then you can actually go for expert exam. Okay, uh, so what about uh, prices? Uh, as, as you might see on the screen, uh, for uh, three courses, specialist, professional, expert, prices are adjusted. There are new prices um, taking into account that there are more days and there are more materials and there are more things to learn. You may see that prices are, uh, let's say, uh, adjusted, but not as, as, as high as you may uh, expect. The same pricing stays for exams, so there are no changes. And those are the, the prices for the exams. Actually, I'm, I'm scrolling pretty fast through my slides. Uh, first, slides will be available later on. Second, you may always contact either Zabbik sales team to uh, get to learn how much uh, the training will cost for you, or you may contact uh, any of our partners, training partners available around the world, delivering trainings in all languages. And um, they should be able to um, actually quote you with a, with a price. So what's, what's next new coming is actually extra courses. So what is an extra course? If you remember uh, at the beginning of the presentation, I said that it's major courses. There are four major courses. Now it's an extra course. An extra course is a new thing for Zabbix. It's an online course. It's actually one day. So it's between five to eight hours. It's very practical hands-on training. So we go deep in, into some specific details, what course is about. There is no special pre-requirement. So there is no requirements for you to attend Zabbix Certified Specialist Professional Expert course. Of course, we expect that you know the topic that you are trying to attend or you know the basics because that's gonna be in-depth course on specific topic. There is no exam. We are saying it's a very kind of a, a hands-on uh, very practical um, uh, course. And uh, of course, at the end of the course, you will uh, get the special certificate uh, for the attendance of this course. So if we're talking which actually courses will be uh, available at first, uh, the list of the courses will definitely be extended, but uh, we are talking about uh, Zabbix API, Zabbix pre-processing, Zabbix automation and discovery, Zabbix visualize, it, Zabbix performance optimization, SNMP, SNMP traps, MP, uh, MP, uh, APMI, um, and as I said, other topics are coming. Um, so what's going to be the price? It's pretty easy. It's one price for any extra course. So it's, uh, as I said, it's one day course. It's a remote course. You can take it anytime. There is no requirements or pre-requirements to attend this course. 
And except for, I mean, if you plan to uh, attend Zabbix API, most likely uh, you, you need to have some experience in using API or at least some, some very basic uh, kind of uh, experience in programming and, and integrating one, let's say, uh, application with another application. The same goes for probably uh, Zabbix uh, performance optimizations. Optimization, we would expect that you're actually already using Zabbix and you have some knowledge and you have some issues with performance. And then you uh, will attend the course and you will be able to solve all of your issues with performance. So um, what is more important, we decided to introduce a special bundle. So if you attend any of the major courses, which I mentioned um, uh, before, and, uh, but actually it's, it's specific uh, major courses, Zabbix Specialist, Zabbix Professional, or Zabbix Expert, then uh, attendance or purchase of any extra course within six months from attendance of this uh, training will be at the discounted price. So if, if you attended the Specialist, if you attended the Professional, then you can jump on additional extra courses and get them at the better price. So consider that when, when budgeting uh, for, for the new uh, Zabbix training program. So update training courses. Um, as we were uh, looking at the, uh, let's say, um, uh, our poll, there are people uh, who has attended Zabbix 4.0 version and 3.0 version and some other previous versions. So definitely it might be very interesting for you to actually uh, kind of uh, uh, understand completely what's going on in Zabbix 5.0, how to apply it, how to use it. And uh, for some people it's actually, or for some users of Zabbix, it's also very important to hold the most recent certificate of Zabbix. So what do we have ready for that is a new update options. Actually, there are two paths or two ways to update. And uh, on the left from the right, uh, uh, let's say uh, from the red line, you see two options and to the uh, uh, right, there are uh, another two options. So let's start with the left options. It's um, kind of a Zabbix certified specialist update and Zabbix certified professional update course that each takes one day. It's online, exam is not included. Uh, it is a pure diff between Zabbix 4.0 and Zabbix 5.0 training course. And it is intended only for those who has attended uh, in 4.0 training. So if you hold the Zabbix 2.0 certificate or 3.0 uh, certificates, the left options are actually not for you. So it's only to update those students who has attended 4.0 to the latest 5.0 version. If you do not hold the 4.0 certificate, then please look to the right. And uh, there are um, also two options, specialist and professional. Actually, you're going to take the same course as I was mentioning before, the same five days and the same three days course for the specialist and professional respectively. However, it will have a special price. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, kind of almost 50% off from the uh, original price. As I mentioned, uh, it's, it's good for any level of the certificate that you have. Uh, it will be delivered in classroom, in person, uh, exams are included and you can also of course take the bundle. So you may uh, to take two courses at the price of 1,700. So if you are the students who have attended Zabbix in just recent one and a half years, this is uh, let's say uh, a good option for you uh, to just uh, get through all the material once again learn everything. However, you have this option where you will be just presenting with a, with a, what is different from five zero or from four zero to five zero. So um, you may uh, go for, for any option and um, just maybe if I will be allowed to do the second poll, uh, it would be interested to know uh, which actually um, 
option, okay, um, is, is the best for you. So, um, of course, that's, uh, we are talking about only those students uh, who have ever attended uh, Zabbix training. Because if you are new to this training, uh, none of this option uh, is, is, uh, is kind of uh, available for you. Uh, but uh, those options will stay uh, now with Zabbix, which means that if you attend the full training with, uh, with the Zabbix, then uh, when, whenever Zabbix seeks out is zero, you will be able to uh, select your path and will be able to choose actually uh, either to go an expressway or to go the full training, but just at a very attractive, very affordable price. So, okay, while uh, Paul is still going on, I will uh, jump on uh, another slide. And um, I think this is a very, very important question right now. We are talking about uh, a special situation in the world where most of us are not really um, able to travel, uh, but we really want to learn something new during this, uh, th these times. And um, Zabbix, as you might know, was for many, many years available in the classroom option or on-site option. A classroom option is actually when you arrive to a specific training room and you uh, uh, have a, a trainer in, in front of you in, in the same, uh, in the same uh, room. And uh, this is the usual way how we did it for many, many years. Actually, we have another option that is uh, there for as many years as classroom is that we are always uh, available to arrive to your company premises and deliver on-site training for uh, a specific company where all the um, students are from the same company. And now what's going on or what will happen with the release of uh, Zabbix 5.0, Zabbix major courses will become available in the virtual environment. So what are we talking about? It's a live training, trainer-led training conducted over the internet. So basically as the same way as we are talking right now to you, uh, and, and you're coming to this uh, event from uh, all around the world. The same will happen with the training. So uh, we'll be um, delivering training over the internet. Uh, groups in this case will be uh, limited to five students in order to keep the quality and able to um, uh, provide support to all the students. Um, we, we understand that uh, providing it globally will require uh, us to work in a different time zones and different languages. And here we, we, we uh, will employ uh, our great uh, training partner network. Uh, as you might know, uh, trainings uh, uh, for Zabbix are taking place uh, in, in many languages. Uh, just a few to mention is uh, Chinese, Japanese, uh, Russian, German, French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, probably some other languages as well. Um, so uh, yes, uh, and, and you would be able to, to s select uh, which time zone you are, you are comfortable with and which language you are comfortable with. So uh, the price for the classroom and virtual training are the same. So there is no confusion, it's easy you select whatever you prefer. Right now, we are all limited to a virtual training. However, I believe uh, very soon we would be able to go back to classrooms and it will be just uh, your choice. Um, and as I mentioned, the trainings will be delivered both by Zabbix and Zabbix training partners. Okay, uh, just a few last topics uh, to present. So as, as you might know, when when you attend in Zabbix, uh, you, you actually leave Zabbix training with some Zabbix symbols, some merchandise on your hands. So we have updated that as well. So for the course attendance, so now it, it goes all new. So as, as for many, many years, uh, for the specialist, it's going to be a Zabbix t-shirt or Zabbix polo. So it's a black one, very similar to one that I'm wearing right now. For the professional, we are saying that it's going to be Thermomug. Those guys are really probably uh, sitting ill, uh, long evenings at work configuring Zabbix. Might be that they will be interested in hot or, or cold drinks. And for the expert, it's going to be uh, Zabbix backpack. So all of your Zabbix knowledge 
all of your uh, Zabbix books and, and Zabbix documentation, you can uh, uh, keep it in, in this great backpack. Uh, if we're talking about certificates for the course attendance, it's coming uh, with a new design. As I have mentioned, certificates are produced for uh, all major courses as well as extra courses. So uh, after each course, you will surely get this certificate. And what is the most probably interesting? Uh, okay, I don't have this pin, but I'm neither a Zabbix specialist or professional uh, or, or expert, but starting from uh, version Zabbix 5.0, there are going to be also a special pin that will be distributed to those who pass Zabbix exam. And as you might see, depending on the course uh, level, you may start with one star, two stars, three stars, and then um, I'm not sure, probably this is something close to general, and this is, I'm not sure, maybe a captain. I'm not that good in, in, uh, in army symbolics. Uh, and of course, uh, for passing an exam, uh, you'll get a special certificate that, uh, that puts you on, on, the, on the role of, of great Zabbix, uh, let's say, uh, experts and, and professionals. Okay, if we're talking about Zabbix uh, 5.0 training availability, then actually you may uh, navigate to this website, zabbix.com training, uh, um, sorry, um, training schedule. Um, these courses are still the, the, the current for zero courses, while what you see here starting from mid of June, all of these uh, training courses are actually uh, Zabbix 5.0. I, I made this screenshot maybe a few hours ago. I know that right now the web page is updated even further with the many courses uh, uh, from many partners from in many languages available already right now. So if you are interested, uh, while maybe uh, being uh, locked in, in, in your house to attend um, uh, a virtual session and to get Zabbix certified, um, please contact our partners, please contact our sales, apply for the courses, get Zabbix certified. Um, I think you should actually act fast because as I have mentioned, currently the groups are limited to five people per group, which might create a kind of a, a lack of training courses. Uh, so, uh, but um, definitely we'll follow the, the demand and if, if necessary, we'll uh, publish uh, more sessions. So, okay, um, I think I'm done with my presentation. Sorry if it took a bit longer than expected and um, I'm not sure if there are any questions to me, I will be uh, happy to answer. Um, at the same time, as I mentioned, the presentations will be available. Prices, uh, you, will, uh, you will see the prices and the rules. And, and then don't forget to contact our training partners. Don't forget to contact us. We'll be um, happy to, to assist you with attending uh, those courses. Thank you a lot, Sergei. So we have a lot of questions, some of them more simple than the others, some of them maybe more complicated. Um, so first off, a simple question, where can I pass Zabbix exam and I guess how can I pass it? What's the procedure for just passing the exam? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, the previous procedure for Zabbix 4.0 was uh, that you had to attend the exam or pass the exam in person. So you had to contact Zabbix, um, Zabbix company or Zabbix uh, training partner, agree on time, arrive to their office and pass the exam. Right now with uh, Zabbix training going uh, virtual, uh, that's a matter of actually contacting partners and Zabbix, agreeing on time and doing it over the internet. So uh, again, uh, Zabbix exams will be available starting from mid June uh, together with the courses. So right now we are doing the last polishing on slides on uh, exam questions and, uh, and other topics, including um, technology. But yeah, just contact Zabbix, contact um, our partners, and we'll be happy to arrange that. Thank you. Next up, um, if you follow a course, is the exam included in the price also, or is it a separate price? Yeah, um, actually, exam is in included in any major course as a bonus. So uh, if you decide to, to attend a specialist or professional or expert or user, uh, it's already in there. 
So you buy the course, uh, the exam will be given uh, to you as a bonus on, on the last uh, hour or two hours of, of your course. Um, next question is a quick one. I can just read it out loud and answer myself straight up. Is the certified professional course a four day or a three day course? It's a three day course, correct? It's a three day course. It might be there, it could be a confusion that um, uh, let's say, uh, initially, there was a big discussion whether it's going to be three or four days because uh, some of, let's say, our trainers and our partners said that there are a lot of information that we should deliver. However, we uh, kind of uh, decided to go on the three days course. However, expert was extended, as you, as you might see, from three days to five days. So, but a professional, it's a three days course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next up, a location-specific question. Is there training available in Colombia? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, actually, if you go on our web page and, and search, um, I, I will not remember from my head the name of the partner, uh, but we have a training partner actually in Colombia. So uh, and, uh, definitely the course will be delivered in Spanish. Um, just go on our training website and, 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 and search for the training in Colombia. If it's not published at this moment, it's coming in a, maybe a day or two. Currently, all of our partners are sending us uh, their, uh, let's say, um, schedules, sessions for upcoming months. We are in the constant process of publishing new sessions uh, where the partners already uh, will be delivering 5.0 training. Okay, thank you. Next up. So let's say I have an exam certificate for Zabbix 4.0 and I want to attend the professional and expert course for Zabbix 5.0. Do I have to okay. upgrade course first or how would that work? Okay, a, a, a student have a specialist for zero and he now wants to go to a, um, a professional 5.0, right? A student has a specialist and professional for zero. He wants to go professional and expert five zero. Yeah, if he will go in the sequence from, uh, let's say, professional first to five, I mean, and then expert, uh, uh, I don't see any problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, next up, is there, a, I guess you kind of partially answered that, but is there a plan to run online courses and webcam protected exams? So maybe you can focus on the exam part since you're kind of talking about that. Oh yeah, uh, uh, definitely exams will be uh, available in those virtual courses. So it's, uh, uh, it's the same as in a classroom. The procedure will be, uh, let's say, uh, there are gonna be a specific procedure. We'll ask you to, to do a few things like uh, turning your camera on and so on. But all of these instructions will be uh, made available to, to all the students uh, previous to, to attending the course and actually during the, the purchase process. Uh, but, but definitely, uh, exams uh, are, are included in the virtual uh, classes. Mm -hmm. And the last one, is it possible to only take the exam without the training? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's my, that might be not very clear uh, on our web page, or maybe it's not that easy to find. But if you navigate to the training section, there is uh, exam sections, and, and then you can actually go and purchase uh, exams separately from, from the training. That's, that's available for quite a time, and it's available on our web page. And as well as uh, you, if, if you contact your uh, training partners in your country, just uh, tell them that you are interested only in taking the exam and they should be able to quote you with, with the exam price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That was the last one. Thank you a lot. Okay. Thank you all for, for interesting questions. Mm -hmm. um, so as we can see, there's a lot of work to do, a lot of preparation to do, not just for students, but also for trainers, since this is completely being kind of revised and redone. So we kind of have to also get up to par. So Sergey was our last speaker. Um, and before I thank you all for attending, um, I'd like to maybe invite Alexi back in uh, to have some final words for you guys. So let's welcome Alexi back. Uh, yeah, so actually I, would, I, 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 I was really happy to participate today. I see there is a great interest in the Zabbix 5.0 and it was really a result of uh, uh, nine months of work of the whole Zabbix team. And actually on behalf of Zabbix team, uh, I would like to thank all Zabbix users. Um, thank you for using our software. 
uh, especially I would like to thank our customers who use our services like uh, training sessions, uh, what Sergey mentioned, like uh, support services, and really your support helps us to develop a, a better product, to grow team, to make a high quality product and to, to implement a, kind of a better, a, a better monitoring, which is really available to, to everyone, to everyone. So it's free and open source. And I really enjoy the fact that Zabbix is being used everywhere, not only, not only by, I don't know, by companies who may afford it, by, by individuals, by small businesses, by medium businesses. So that's, that's, uh, that's uh, what, what, what I enjoy very much and uh, I, 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 I love it. So, um, all right, maybe um, before, before we end, I would like to answer one question regarding the time scale database. I see there is a great interest in, a, from a user point of view, that, okay, I, I would like to migrate to time scale database. Time scale database is so exciting. And uh, at, this, at this point of time, support of time scale database is still experimental. It basically means that you, you would use it uh, at your own risk, yeah? And the reason why it's still experimental is because we are waiting for some level of maturity or stability from time scale point of view. The technology is very exciting, yeah? Uh, but um, we saw some cases when some features of time scale DB were deprecated. Uh, as far as I understand, maybe I'm wrong, but Timescale database company, uh, they do provide commercial support only for SaaS, uh, software as a service uh, version of the Timescale, so Timescale database. So there are some concerns, yeah? And that's why we're waiting for a little bit better maturity level of Timescale DB before we can kind of officially recommend it for, to end users and to, to, to our customers, okay? so. I would say that for uh, serious production use, I would probably recommend you to stay at MySQL or Postgres database on Oracle. Maybe let's wait a little bit like uh, one year or so and then see if timescale DB will be ready so that we can tell finally officially, okay guys, this is, this is kind of the database, dat database of choice now. Okay, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Well, thank you, thank you very much, and well, see you next time. Thanks, thanks for being with us. Thanks. Um, thank you, Alexei. Actually, we do have some additional questions, and actually we've decided internally to use this oh, good. the occasion to just cover <laughs> so no one kind of gets left. I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we won't uh, let you off that easy. Um, so, first off, when is vector graphics coming up for latest data graphs? Oh yeah, so uh, it is coming. It is part of the roadmap. It's been planned for 4.4, it's been planned for 5.0. Now it's kind of postponed to 5.2 5 or 5.4. Yeah, we are working on this. Um, all right, next up. Assuming health regulations allow it, do you guys plan on hosting the annual Zabbix conference at Riga? Yeah, absolutely. It really depends on, um, on what our government says. So. Yeah, so we, we, we hope so. At this moment, I would say that it's kind of a 50-50 probability, but uh, I, I really hope that it is coming because we all really enjoy face-to-face -face communication, I guess. Not using the Skype or WebEx or something else, but yeah, face-to-face -face is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One more. Is new Zabbix Agent 2 compiled for Windows MSI so it's downloadable? Oh yeah, so it's, it will be available very soon. We are working on this. So at this moment, I think only binaries, uh, the pure binaries are available for a Windows platform, but we are working on MSI packages. I think they will be available in a kind of, in a, in a couple of weeks time. Mm -hmm. And we have them coming in. So one more. Do you recommend to use 5.0 LTS in production already or as best practices say when new releases arrive to wait for some minor updates before using them in prod? Well, it, 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 depends, uh, it depends on production, I guess. Yeah, so how, how, big, and, uh, how big is your setup and how, how critical it is. But uh, obviously, I think this is a general, uh, general rule that maybe it's better to wait for, for maybe a, a few minor releases, maybe 5.0.1 or 5.0.2, yeah? 
uh, at this moment, we haven't found any kind of blocker issues uh, with uh, our first release of 5.0. I think it is pretty stable. Uh, yeah, we, we hit this uh, kind of famous Postgres bug, which uh, I think Alexander has mentioned uh, regarding this uh, kind of out of memory situation. It has nothing to do with it, time scale. It's, it, it's not on time scale DB side. It is on, it, it's on Postgres side, yeah. So in 5.0.1, uh, uh, we basically decrease a number of partitions created for time scale database, and it will help to solve this issue. So um, yeah, so that's the only issue I'm, I'm out of my head that just, uh, I remember maybe, maybe there, there are some others, but I, I'm not aware. So Zabbix 5.0 is pretty stable. All right, thank you. Uh, and by the way, sorry, sorry, uh, another one. Um, there, were, uh, there was some question regarding this compression rate uh, if we switch to time scale database. And actually we have some numbers from a real production environments. And uh, actually the compression rate with the time scale database is a pretty impressive. It's about, one, uh, it's about we, we get about uh, nine up to 10 X compression. Yeah, so if you have like a one terabyte database, there's a great chance it will be compressed uh, down to 120, 140 gigabytes. Yeah, so it, it is impressive. Yeah, those are, those are pretty insane numbers. And yeah, yeah. Um, jump off of that question to the next one. And so, and after a year, if timescale DB is not so good or if some issue appears, how do we go back? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, as I said before, it's on your risk, yeah. So. Um, if you use a time scale database, uh, we do all our best uh, to, to support it, of course. But uh, if a time scale database at some point uh, tells that, okay we, are, we, okay, we are building, I don't know, closed source pro product, uh, the open source revision is not supported or anymore or something like that, well, it's something, it's something out of our control, unfortunately. And something completely unrelated. Um, I think you've heard quite a lot about this. When you are going to introduce PDF or CSV reporting? Uh, PDF or CSV reporting, it's, it's uh, also now roadmap. Uh, and there are a number of ways how to, how to achieve this. Well, it, it is coming. It is coming. I cannot tell you exactly when. Uh, it might be delivered because it's 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 very complex topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think everyone just wanted to hear from you that hey, you're thinking about it. It's coming, and it's not something that we forgot yeah. about or just completely neglect neglected. Um, next up, when is it expected to get out of the box templates for AWS monitoring? Oh, it's absolutely coming 5.2. Yeah, okay. actually, actually, uh, our integration team is is already working on AWS monitoring on monitoring of AWS services out of the box. Yeah, good to hear. Um, a lot of new templates, and yeah, good to hear that AWS is joining that. Um, next up, maybe you or Sergey can answer that. So it's regarding the webinars. So any chance that there will be more flexibility on webinars? Currently, they're always starting at 10 a.m., but I think I'm not a single person who can't do this at this specific time. Any chances to provide some kind of evening sessions for Russian oh. webinars? Okay, it's, it's going for, for Russian webinars. Um, actually, right now with, uh, let's say, with um, training and as well as webinars, uh, we'll uh, provide more flexibility. Uh, so uh, please stay tuned. Uh, webinars will be uh, kind of uh, available in more time zones. And the same goes to training. So uh, training by Zavix, uh, let's say, in different languages so will be available for different time zones. We are working on that hard. Mm -hmm. Good to hear. Yeah, Sergey, correct me if, if uh, I'm wrong, but I think normally we do, if, if we do basically two webinars in uh, morning time and evening time, at least we, we are doing all our best to deliver two webinars in a, in, in, in a specific language like uh, English or, or Russian or any, any, any other. Yeah. I think probably the question was about uh, us delivering, let's say, the same webinar in Russian, not in the morning, but in the evening. Probably the person is, is just yeah, that was is not question. available in the morning. So it's kind okay. of an option. 
to, to, to shift it to the optimum time. Yeah, so, I, I, I guess we should probably do more, but also I think the, the recordings of the webinars are available. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. So basically, if you, if you have no chance to, to visit our webinar, you can, you can watch them uh, afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, more questions coming in. Edgar says uh, he can't manage to copy them all in time because there are so many. Um, another one that I think me and you covered during the webinar, but not everyone has heard the answer to it. So what about um, HA or DR for Zabbix servers, not just proxies? Uh, yeah, so the, the, the whole topic of the HA redundancy and load balancing, it's been again part of Zabbix 5.0 uh, and uh, it's been postponed to, to 5.2. Okay, I, I think I already answered about the baseline monitoring. The, the, the situation with the baseline monitoring was exactly the same. We really, uh, we really hoped to, to, to have it delivered in 5.0, but sorry, uh, we didn't manage. To, so that it's all postponed to 5.2 or 5.4. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure about this question. I'm just gonna read it and maybe it was kind of already covered, but is there any roadmap against schedule reports? I think it's very it's very related to to the question with the PDF reporting. Yes, I I'd love to see it implemented. Yeah, it's it's really what we miss very much, and our users and customers miss very much. Mm -hmm. um, one more integration question: Will we see any native integration with Remedy? Oh yeah, it's coming. It's it's already in our roadmap. Yeah. Also with the Helix ITSM, I think it's called Helix now. Mm -hmm. Um, one more question in the Q&A section. Um, are we updating in some way templates uh, from 4.0 to 5.0? Is there some sort of native upgrade process or how should users proceed if they want to use these templates, the new ones? All right. So if you're upgrading from a previous version of Zabbix, we don't, we don't uh, install any or update. We don't install any new templates or update your existing templates. What you have to do, you have to go to, to Zabbix website. Uh, to our repository, uh, download the latest template and try to try to update uh, update your system, because uh, updating of the templates automatically it's it, it might be a little bit dangerous process. So mm -hmm. we're trying to be very safe. Yeah, thank you, Alexei. This was I think a lot of questions regarding different topics, but we've covered all of them from the looks of it. Um, so thank you, and I think this is this is it. Yeah, thank you guys. We had quite a lot of you. I think we were seeing like summit number of people over here and we're really glad about that. And, and I think since this is a, a good experience for us and a good experience for you guys, as you can see, everyone was able to chime in, answer their questions live and we answered a lot of the questions. Now I'm looking at the Q&A section, I'm seeing 196 answered questions. That's just an insane amount. Um, so really crazy. So I think this will be, this format is here to stay. Um, maybe we'll change some things, maybe we'll improve it further and so on as we learn and as we go. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you from all over the world. This has been a great opportunity for us to connect with you and a great opportunity for you to connect with us. It's such an open format. And keep an eye out on our events, keep an eye out on our webinars, trainings, things that you're interested in. And see you next time, guys. Thank you a lot. See you next time. Thank you, everybody.